Why do we need stormwater management systems? Since the 1980s, stormwater management systems have been required for new development and are specifically designed to help prevent flooding and remove pollutants from the water. A stormwater or detention pond is designed to collect and manage stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff can carry many different types of pollutants. Sediment, garbage, fertilizer, pesticides, oil, animal waste and bacteria, and yard waste. When rainwater lands on rooftops, parking lots, streets, driveways, and other hard surfaces, the rainfall that doesn't soak into the ground flows into your neighborhood stormwater pond through catch basins, pipes, shallow swales, or ditches. Without these ponds, runoff would carry pollutants like those mentioned and anything else that can float into nearby wetlands, streams, rivers, estuaries, or the Gulf of Mexico. Stormwater ponds are engineered systems designed to remove excess nutrients and other pollutants that can negatively affect our water bodies. They allow sediments in the water to settle at the bottom of the pond and not discharge downstream. They help remove nutrients, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus, that can come from lawn fertilizers or natural sources, such as animal waste. Nutrients cause algae and bacterial blooms in water bodies, which consume the oxygen that fish and other aquatic life needs to live. Engineered control structures prohibit garbage and floating debris from entering the receiving water body. Officials sometimes have to close our recreational water bodies due to pollutants, which cause human health hazards. But engineered stormwater ponds can help remove hazardous pollutants before discharging into our water bodies. Now that you know about these pollutants, please help Manatee County maintain our natural resources by following these tips. Never dump anything down storm drains or into stormwater ponds. Use fertilizers and pesticides sparingly. Properly dispose of pet waste. Control soil erosion by planting over bare spots in landscape. Sweep driveways and sidewalks instead of using a hose to discharge to the street. Properly dispose of yard waste. Properly dispose of hazardous household chemicals. Direct downspouts away from paved surfaces. And check your car for oil leaks. For more information, go to mymanatee.org stormwater. A roundabout is a compact, circular intersection with traffic flowing counterclockwise around a center island. Roundabouts can have a single lane or multiple lanes. Roundabout design channels traffic into the flow and are designed to slow traffic approaching and within the roundabout. Splitter islands direct and slow traffic as it enters the roundabout. The splitter islands offer pedestrians and bicyclists a spot to pause as they cross the road, allowing for safer crossings. The center island uses truck aprons, a raised area around the center island, which gives large trucks and even emergency vehicles a bit more room to move through the circle.
Good morning, everyone. Everyone had a wonderful morning, and welcome to another beautiful day in Manatee County, even though it's a little cloudy outside. We just got back from Tallahassee, where it was 16 degrees yesterday, so a welcome 50-degree weather. Um, <laughs> what we would always do at the beginning of every meeting is that we honor our God and honor our country, and today we have Reverend Edward Dawkins from the Northminster Presbyterian Church. He's going to come forward and lead us in our invocation. And Marine Corps combat veteran Jason Bearden will lead us in our pl uh, pledge of the, of the flag. Good morning, sir. How are you? If you can, please rise. Good morning, sir, and thank you for having me here. Welcome, everybody, on behalf of our leadership at Northminster Presbyterian Church. I'm glad to be here. Our elders and who are our leaders and our deacons, who are our care people, send me with their best wishes. When I told them I was praying for the government, they said, how long are you going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I brought my folder, I brought my Bible, and I thought to myself, well, <laughs> I only have so long. Thanks be to God. We have a memorial service for a judge, a longtime judge and member of our church, Following this, I'll rush right back over to the church. But it reminded me that we are you. Oftentimes, the government is them, and we blame them for all of our woes. And I, I've just heard just a brief history of the things you'll be dealing with. I just got the docket. God bless you. I'm leaving in just a few minutes. I brought just as much paperwork, but I condensed it so that you would know that I was respectful of your time. When I heard that you wanted to think about God first, I thought, well, what? passage of the Bible might be appropriate, and so I picked one, Philippians chapter 1, just a couple of verses. In this, Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I thought to myself, does anybody ever thank you <laughs> for serving I hear that Manatee County is growing. Is that right? Not just a little, but a lot. There are those who want and those who don't want, and I figure it's hard to be a leader of this county. So I thank you for doing your job, and our congregation will pray for you. We are a distinctly Christian church, and so I don't mind saying that Jesus stood before governments as well. It didn't go so well for him, but I hope you'll be nicer to me. But I remind myself that Jesus was born in a little town that was growing, and he grew up underneath the authority of local leaders and officials who managed his life and all the people around him. And so let me pray for us all this way. Lord, we lift up our leaders today. We pray for our mayor, our city council, our commissioners, our police chiefs, our officers, judges, emergency personnel, and all who serve our local communities. Strengthen them with wisdom and grace for the leadership burdens they carry. May they manage their teams and projects with love, grace, and understanding. Keep their hearts pure and their eyes turned towards your face as they work in the best interests of their people. They are called to serve. I pray for them and with them in Jesus' name. May their meeting be blessed. May their time with you and with the people here be of companionship and of justice and of grace. In Christ's name we pray and say, Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend, for your kind words and your prayer for us today. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Bearden, for your doing the pledge this morning and for your service to the country and to the Marine Corps. Thank you, sir. All right, moving along. Ms. Knapp, where's she? Okay. Are there any updates to the agenda? There have been two updates to the agenda since it was published yesterday afternoon. Those additions will be public comment under items number 11 and 13, and the case planner will provide those for the record when we uh, open those items later this morning. All right, thank you, ma'am. That concludes the addition. Would you also like to introduce someone? I would. Good, uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I would like to take this time to introduce um, and announce, uh, formally introduce you to Rachel Layton. 
Um, she's here in the audience. She can step forward with me. Rachel will be our new Development Services Division Manager and Impact Fee Administrator. After interviewing several candidates across the country, um, fortunately enough, we found someone in our backyard, literally. And so <laughs> uh, Rachel comes to us in, as an AICP certified planner with a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and a master's in urban and regional planning from Florida State and over 25 years of a wide array of experience, uh, planning experience. Um, ironically enough, she began her career here at Manatee County as a planning intern. And after sh uh, she finished grad school, she actually moved here. So um, since that time, you name it, she's done it. Uh, design and build construction, environmental analysis, paralegal work and land with land use attorneys, code enforcement, building permit review, impact fee credit and over uh, agreement oversight, local development agreements, and a compilation of many, many analysis of comp plan amendments, rezones, special permits, variances, and affordable housing projects for her clients. Uh, given Rachel's experience, we feel very confident with our decision that we've made, and we decided to blend a few different areas up on the fourth floor in our planning division. So Ms. Rachel will oversee what was our comprehensive planning division and long-range planning, all of public hearing, those planners that work under public hearing, affordable housing, and most importantly to me, <laughs> impact fee administrator. <laughs> so I can take that hat off. <laughs> uh, Rachel began two days ago, so you're not gonna see her at the staff table quite yet. We'll give her a couple weeks, but um, she actually probably could have fit in quite well there today, and she knows our code and comp plan sometimes better than the staff does, so. But uh, welcome to Rachel. Yep. Thank you, I'm looking forward to this new role and, and helping the community grow. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. It's great having you on board. I mean, I've, you've come before me several times in the Planning Commission when I was on the Planning Commission. You always done a fantastic job up there, and so I know you do a fantastic job on this side of the, the table now that you've joined us. Welcome aboard. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to give one, sure. we're thrilled to have Rachel, your, your reputation precedes you, which is all good, and kudos to Nicole Knapp for, for Vanity County stealing someone from the private sector for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving along. Um, next up is uh, citizen's comment. This would be for, <clears throat> excuse me, this would be for a comment for any future agenda items. If anyone would like to come forward and speak on any future agenda item, this is the time to do it. If you do come forward, please state your name and your county of residence, and you have three minutes. Hi, um, my name is Ida Fiorella. I'm a Manatee County resident, 4602 Halls Mill Crossing in Ellington. And um, my concern is just in general with all the new development that's been going on, um, 60th Avenue East, and uh, this is in Ellington, right near the Prime Outlets. Um, would I be able to put a map up to show you what the problem is? Yes, ma'am, you can. Okay, so would I put it here? Where you're, you're right there. It's perfect. Yes, ma'am. Oh, what? You can put it right there in the oh, square. Right okay. okay, this is what the problem is. Um, 60th Avenue East runs to 301, and they're putting in an extension road from Buffalo Road Extension which is going to really increase traffic. And already traffic oftentimes is backed up all the way down the, this one mile stretch and into Mendoza Road. We come in, my, our home is in Covered Bridge Estates. And what's happening is all these new complexes keep um, being um, approved. Like, um, Ma'am, I hate to interrupt you, but can you kind of talk into the microphone so we oh, can I'm sorry. hear you and so, then you have to be off yes, record. Thank you. So uh, we've had... Um, 135 mm -hmm. built. So, like, we have these... You guys have all done such a beautiful job with the development. We have these beautiful homes in Covered Bridge, Oakleaf Hammock, um, Oakley Place, I'm sorry, Oakley and Bougainville, and all these homeowners like love and cherish the area, but it's just getting overdone. Um, 
you know, we've got one here that we don't know what's going to happen with this, and we're ter terrified. We had, um, we have thousands of people that are concerned with this, and so uh, we're just hoping that you really take that into consideration as you go forward, and um, uh, please, please take this all into consideration before any more multi-units are put here, because it's just created such a strain and stress on us, and we just trusting all of you to take care of us. So um, I thank you for all, all you've done, you know, in the past, and hope that you, you know, will consider this in any future decisions. Thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, no, you could keep this. Yeah, I need you to give that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Would anyone else like to come forward for public comment on future agenda items? If not, we'll go ahead and close public comment <clears throat> or citizen comment, and we'll move on to our first item. Ms. Knapp, can you read that into the record, please? Yes. Item number one, PDR 2329ZG, Amara Marion Springer. This is a rezone of approximately 20.20 20 acres generally located on the east of I-75 west of Lena Road and approximately one mile south of State Road 64 East. <coughs> <clears throat> from A1 Agricultural Suburban to Plan Development Residential Zoning District and approving a general development plan for 606 multifamily residential units with at least 25% affordable uh, units being designated as affordable housing. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to hear from the applicant. Morning, sir. Please state your name and you know the rule. <laughs> you, know the, you know the drill. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Yeah. Oh, yes, Susan. If anybody, um, what the clerk is needs to do right now is swear everyone in. So if you're going to speak today on any item today and come before us, please raise your right hand and be sworn in by the clerk. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations that you're about to present to the Board of County Commissioners are truthful and accurate? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Scott Rudisel. I'm an attorney at Blaylock Walters. I am here representing the WB Property Group. I am a Manatee County citizen, and I have been sworn. Um, so, as Nicole mentioned, this is a request for a rezone from A1 to PDR with a general development plan for 606 multifamily units, with a minimum of 25% of those being affordable housing. The uh, county has been trying hard to get these types of projects. And so we're happy to be here today presenting this to you. This project did receive expedited review and scheduling priority, and so uh, we appreciate that, and we appreciate all the hard work from staff on this project. This is our development team. Uh, the developer is WB Property Group, and we have David Weinstein here today on behalf of WB. We also have John Cavoli here today, who is our, our project engineer. Just a brief history on WB, since they're new to this area, they have over 100 years experience in developing all types of projects in all areas of the nation with a focus on mixed use and multifamily. And these are some examples from their portfolio. Uh, this is a historic renovation project uh, in New York City for retail office. Uh, this one is a multifamily project in Knoxville, Tennessee. And this is a multifamily project that is underway right now in Round Rock, Texas. So uh, as you can see, they have a, a wide skill set. This is the project site we're going to be talking about today. The site is just over 20 acres. It is located on Lena Road, about a mile south of State Road 64, and it is bordered on the west by I-75. This is a little closer view of the site. You can see it is surrounded largely by existing industrial and light industrial uses. Uh, to the north and the south, there is largely vacant um, and some residential. This is the future land use map for the area. Uh, the site is located within a large area that's designated mixed use on the future land use map. Um, that mixed use category is one of the most intense categories that the county has. Um, it is intended for areas that are going to be developed as major centers of suburban and urban activity. So this project fits right in with the way that the county has planned for this area. 
and hopefully will be a development for uh, catalyst here to de for development south of 64. This is your zoning map area. You can see the site zoned A1. And then as we talked about, there's planned development industrial to the east and to the south of the site. This is your general development plan. Uh, the, as mentioned, the project proposes 606 units, uh, which is consistent with the applicable affordable housing density bonus available under the existing MU category. Uh, those units would be located in multiple buildings with a maximum height of five stories or 60 feet, and the project will comply with all the applicable building height compatibility requirements of the code. <clears throat> the buildings are set back a significant distance from the perimeter of the project, anywhere between 65 and 90 feet. Um, the buildings along I-75 are, um, are closer to the 90 foot. There's also a wetland you can see on the um, northwest corner of the site. It's about a two acre wetland, which is not being impacted. Um, there are some minor impacts in the wetland buffer, but no impacts to the wetland itself. And the project will exceed the 30% open space requirement. This shows the county's planned Lena Road extension project. You're all very familiar with it, um, but it's going to realign and extend Lena Road um, all the way to the extension of 44th Avenue East. It will be a two-lane divided urban roadway, curb and gutter, uh, shared use path and sidewalk. So that's gonna be a major change for that area. Ultimately, that roadway is planned as a four-lane connector that would go all the way from 64 to State Road 70. There are a few specific approvals being requested for the projects. I'm gonna run through those. Um, the code does provide that affordable housing projects should be given design flexibility during the development review process. And in fact, the code gives a 30% allowance for affordable housing projects. You can deviate from the spatial requirements of the code if you're doing affordable housing to help those projects. Um, so we're in the plan development process. We have to ask for them specifically here if we were doing them um, as a... Uh, Live local project, for example, a lot of these would be administrative approvals. The uh, first one is required access. Um, <clears throat> as you know, the code requires at least two means of access. When the project exceeds 100 units, this project is providing two means of access. The only reason we are needing a specific approval is because the code requires that if you have two accesses on the same road, that road has to be a bi directional thoroughfare. Lena Road in this location is not a bi-directional thoroughfare, but we do have two connections that will connect to the future Lena Road, which is a bi-directional thoroughfare. And we believe this meets the intent of the code and addresses the access issues, and staff is in agreement with that. Uh, second request is for reduction in parking. Code requires 1.8 parking spaces per unit. We're requesting a minimum of, or a mac, or a minimum of 1.4. Um, as was mentioned, there's a 30% adjustment that's allowed in the code, which would take you down to 1.26, so we're actually greatly exceeding um, what would generally be required on an affordable project. Majority of the units are gonna be one bedroom anyway, so we don't think parking's gonna be an issue. Uh, we're also requesting some reduced buffers. They're in the areas in yellow. <clears throat> on the north, we're asking for eight feet and 10 feet, where 10 feet, or where 15 would be typical on the roadway buffer along Lena, we're requesting 10 feet, where 20 would be typical. And these are largely necessitated by the desire to provide additional parking <clears throat> and also to work around that two acre, um, two acre wetland area. This project is in the entranceway, so there is enhanced buffering that's required and that will be provided in all the buffers, even the ones that are, are being reduced. Uh, the next, Specific approval is the entryway, entranceway requirement to preserve 75% of the trees over 24 inch DBH on site. That's not gonna happen on this project, um, but this is, this is a request that I think the county sees on a regular basis and trees will be preserved where they can be, which is likely to be along the perimeter of the site. And the final request is for tandem parking. <laughs> Typically, the code doesn't allow for tandem parking on a multifamily project. 
This project actually proposes garages below some of the units, so they're going to have a, a situation similar to single family where you'd have a garage and then a parking space in front. Um, we actually think this is a nice amenity for the project, and, and staff is in agreement with that. <clears throat> These are some of the design inspiration photos, what the buildings might look like on the project. I showed some earlier photos of projects that the WB has done, and so this is what you can anticipate on this, on this project in terms of the design quality. And then here's some concepts for the amenities. Um, current plan does include indoor-outdoor space, pool, wellness center, dog park, pickleball courts. This is going to be a highly, uh, highly amenitized project. Uh, we think this is a great project in a great area, a uh, type of project that the county has been trying to attract. Uh, we did receive a unanimous recommendation from the Planning Commission, and we are respectfully requesting your approval today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, before I go to any questions for the, from the board, um, is there any ex parte that you need to disclose from the board? No, sir. All right. No. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the board? No one's on the board um, to ask any questions. So staff presentation, you're up next. All right. Good morning. Chris Klepek with Development Services. May I have been sworn? Uh, Mr. Roussel did a great job presenting, so I'll just kind of go over uh, some other points here quickly. Um, as we know, this is a rezone request for 20.2 acres from A1 to PDR, Plan Development Residential, with a general development plan for 606 multifamily units with at least 25% designated as affordable housing. They've got seven buildings shown on their GDP, and they're proposing a maximum height of up to five stories. Site is located just east of I-75, west of Lena, and approximately one mile south of State Road 64. And it consists of one parcel totaling 20.2 acres. It's currently zoned A1, or suburban agriculture, and it has a uh, future land use category of MU, or mixed use. And this does allow for up to 30 dwelling units per gross acre for uh, projects designated with affordable housing. And it's also located within the entranceway of I-75. So some history, so historically this, uh, this site's been used as a single family residence, although it's no longer in use. And it's also adjacent to agriculture to the north, single family detached residence to the south, industrial to the east, and I-75 directly to its west. Its current zoning, as I stated, is A1. And as you can see to the north, it's A1. We've got to the east, A1, as well as PDI, or Plan Development Industrial. To the south is PDI as well, although it's directly to the south is a single-family residence, and to the west is A1 across I-75. Uh, future land use category is designated as MU or mixed use, um, and we don't really throw this mixed use future land use category out sparingly throughout the county, so uh, this is designated with, with areas for uh, high public facility and availability um, for, for roadways, uh, uh, let's see, we've got, so I said, surrounded to the north, east, and south with MU, and west across I-75 is Res 1, residential one dwelling per gross acre. GDPs, uh, as I stated, seven structures totaling up to five stories for 606 dwelling units with at least 25% designated as affordable. So we do have six specific approval requests, and I'll go over all of them here in just a second. So for the first ones, uh, for the first one, we've got the uh, roadway buffer reduction from 20 to 10 feet. Oops. The second one, we have got the buffer width reduction from 15 to a minimum of eight. And that's along the northern side. And the third one is the preservation of trees exceeding 24 inch DBH that we typically see um, in the entranceway overlays. So as uh, Mr. Rudisil stated, uh, any project over 100 dwelling units does require a second means of access required to another street. Uh, if no access to another street is <coughs> able to be provided, then at least 300 foot of separation is required to an actual another uh, thoroughfare. Uh, this section of Lena is not designated as a collector, although it ends just to the north of it, right at the corner, um, but still is not a collector. 
Uh, and we do have at least 380 feet approximately shown here in between the, the two entrance exits. Number five is the reduction of the parking spaces required. Uh, we typically require 1.8 parking spaces, and this is a request to have a minimum of 1.4, so the 22% reduction. Um, and there is, as Mr. Russo stated, there, there's a lot of flexibility provided with, with projects designated for affordable housing. Uh, we do allow for up to 30% reduction of numerical requirements for affordable housing projects, although um, it says that it's can be done administratively, but it has to be requested and approved through plan development, and that's what they're doing here today. And the sixth uh, specific approval request is the multiple stacking of spaces. So we would see this uh, typically with a single family residence in their driveway or duplex dwelling um, where they, they park tandem behind one another. Um, they're, they're proposing to have some garage understory parking here. Um, and we, to mitigate for somebody, you know, parking behind them and trapping somebody else in, we've uh, provided a stipulation um, to, that it'll all be uh, properly signed so that they don't, uh, nobody that shouldn't be there is parking behind them. So some positive aspects. So this is an introduction of the multifamily development with affordable housing component into an area that's designated as MU, uh, future land use category. It's a high des density residential development, uh, but it's in close proximity to arterial, arterial roadways with 64 and I-75. And there are also no wetland impacts proposed. Um, some negative aspects is this is a residential, that there's residential dwellings located within pro close proximity to I-75, uh, and with that comes the potential for noise. Um, it's also located uh, within close proximity to the Mantee County landfill, just directly to its east. And this is an introduction of high density into a relatively low density uh, and industrial area. It's a five-story residential uh, building adjacent to a single-family residence. And there, are, uh, there is a specific approval request to significantly reduce the required parking spaces below similar previously approved projects. There are six specific approval requests. <coughs> so some mitigating measures. Um, as I stated, this is, this is uh, right adjacent to I-75. So that being said, at time of final site plan, we will require a noise analysis be provided uh, to ensure that sound, le sound levels are less than 65 dBA. Um, so that could include um, a wall or additional screening. It could include additional um, insulation in the buildings or thicker windows um, to bring down that noise level. Uh, this is a MU future land use category designation, and this is intended for areas uh, with high density and intensity uses. And for the building height, uh, LDC 4 1.5 for the building height compatibility will require um, additional mitigation for, for anything over three stories. Um, and as I stated, so um, with with projects designated for affordable housing, the code does allow for, for flexibility. Um, so for LDC compliance, we do have over the 30% open space uh, provided. There are a, or there is a 20 foot uh, roadway buffer provided along I-75 and the 10 foot roadway buffer along Lena um, is proposed as shown with the specific approval request number one. Uh, we've got the 15-foot road, 15-foot uh, perimeter buffers separating adjacent properties. Aside from the eight and 10-foot buffers uh, shown in specific uh, specific approval request number two, we've got 30-foot wetland buffers provided. The building height compatibility will be provided as applicable at time of final site plan, as well as all the sidewalks will be constructed throughout the development in compliance with LDC section 1001.6 and there are no wetland impacts proposed. Um, as I stated, we, we, don't throw, we don't throw around the MU future land use category sparingly. Um, this, is, this is intended for, for centers where there's activities uh, for, for high level of public facility availability. Um, so with that, this is, this is the introduction of a high uh, density development designated as such. Um, 
they're proposing 30 dwelling units per gross acre. <coughs> And policy 2.1.1.4 is promote development in currently undeveloped areas which have the greatest uh, level of public facility availability and investment. Um, as I stated previously, we do have access, or they will have access to 64 and I-75, uh, roughly one, one and a quarter miles to the north. And we also do have the Heritage Harbor DRI on the north side of 64 for amenities. Um, and it is the opinion of staff with, that the proposed GDP with reason to PDR could be found consistent with the comprehensive plan and in compliance with the applicable provisions of the Land Development Code. And I am available for any questions. I believe we have uh, Nelson here for traffic and transportation and Kara Koenig for any environmental questions. And I believe we have Rowena here for any affordable housing questions as well. You bought the whole team. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, is there any questions of staff from the board? Yep. Yeah, let me look. Uh, go ahead. Amanda is up first. Commissioner Bauer. So uh, I just have a, a few questions. I think overall, I this project makes a, a lot of sense. The location <laughs> is really perfect. You know, super high public utility availability. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense. M one concern that I I did have is the noise from the interstate, which you did bring up. So, do we know? You know, once they do that noise study, what the plan is for additional mitigation if they find that it is above 65 decibels? Or is that something to be decided after that study? It'll be determined after the study has, has been done. Um, okay. it's, it's further my understanding that any mitigative measures will be required and, and it'll be determined with that study. Okay. And then um, I, I think all of my other questions are affordability related, so I might need Rowena. Morning. Good For the morning. record, Rowena Young Gopi, Affordable Housing Development Coordinator, and I have not been sworn. Oh. If there's anyone else we haven't been sworn in who has participated, <coughs> will you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations you are about to make to the Board of County Commissioners are truthful and accurate? Yes. Thank you. Will you step to the podium, please state your name, county of residence, and which reason is sworn? Okay. Uh, so how how long is the LURA for this project? They are a moderate income affordability, okay. and it's 20 years. 20 years, and moderate income affordability, is that the 80 to 120 yes. level? Okay. And then um, I, I kept hearing that we're looking at a minimum of 25% affordability uh, or affordable units. So that's probably 150. 152 units, to be exact. So... Um, is there a possibility of additional affordable units or we just or is it really 152 and that's it? Well, it's estimated at this time so the developer can decide to change his decision at final site plan. Okay, so so that's the minimum. It, they could potentially still do more if they do more if they yes. choose. Okay. That's it for me for now. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Turner. Isn't this exciting, actually? Affordable housing coming to District 5, <laughs> showing that it's possible. You know what? I had uh, similar similar concerns as uh, Amanda, which was the sound mitigation, but I think mostly that's been satisfied. I mean, looking at the plan, I don't think there's any way to mitigate the sound through buffers or natural, so it would have, it's likely going to have to be insulation and, and windows. So if the developer's okay with that, then we should have no problems. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you, sir. Commissioner Cruz. I think my question was already answered. Uh, I was going to ask about where it was relative to impact fees, but 80 to 120 percent doesn't get impact fee credit, just density bonus. So uh, Amanda's question, or Commissioner Ballard's question answered my question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, we'll ask for any public comment regarding this item. If you, if you would like to step to the podium. Please state your name, county residence, and you have three minutes. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Go to the, is there any other questions for the applicant, for the staff? All right, here we go. Um, staff closing comments? We're good? All right, give me a thumbs up. You're good. Applicant rebuttal, thank you very much. But, um, we have a motion to approve by Jason Beard and a second by...
Commissioner Van Ossenbridge, uh, if you could vote at this time. And the motion carries seven nothing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next item, snap. Item number two, PDC 2219P, take five car wash. Boeing U.S. Holding Inc. has the applicant has actually withdrawn their application. Okay. So does too many car washes officially? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. All right. So this 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 requires no action, no comment, since it's being withdrawn. So thank you, Ms. Knapp. On to the number three. Item number three, PDR 0439 GR3, the concessions. This item is being continued to no date set and re-advertise. Okay. What I'd like to do right now is call for a public comment. If there's any public comment on this item, on the continuance of this item, please step forward, state your name, you have been sworn, and your county residence. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. If I can get a motion. Motion is made by Commissioner Beard and second by Commissioner Ballard. If anyone could vote at this time. And the item carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Um, item number four, PDMU 1616GR2 Parish Lakes General Development Plan Amendment. This item is being continued to February 1st, 2024 at 9 a.m. or as soon thereafter as may be heard. Thank you, Ms. Knapp. I'd like to open this item for public comment. If anyone would like to come forward to, to comment on the continuance, please come forward, state your name, you've been sworn, and your county residence. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. We have a, a motion by Commissioner Satcher, second by Commissioner Bearden. All the, if we could have our vote now. And the item carries seven to zero. Next item, ma'am. Item number five, PDO 2341ZP, Pace Center for Girls Bradenton. This item as well is being continued to February 1st, 2024, 2024 at 9 a.m. or soon thereafter as may be heard. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to open this item for public comment. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. If I get a motion, thank you. Moved by uh, Commissioner Ballard, second by Commissioner Turner. If we could all vote now. And the item carries seven to zero. Snap. Item number six, LDCT 2317, Ordinance 2402, County Initiated Land Development Code Text Amendment regarding electric vehicles charging stations. And this item is being continued to February 1st, 2024 at 9 a.m. Or, or soon thereafter as may be heard. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Open sign for public comment. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. And if we get a motion, we have a motion by Commissioner Van Ossenbridge and a second by Commissioner Bearden. We all could cast our votes now. Thank you very much. And the motion carries, the item carries 7 0. Ms. Knapp. Item number 7, LDCT 2312, Ordinance 2407, a county initiated land development code text amendment regarding amending uh, amendment mobile, mobile vending. Uh, and this item is being continued to February 22nd, 2024 at 9 a.m. or soon thereafter as may be heard. Thank you, ma'am. I'd like to open a sign for public comment. Seeing none, we'll close public comment. If we uh, have a motion by Commissioner Van Ossenbridge, a second by Commissioner Bearden. We can all vote at this time. All vote. Thank you very much. And the item carries seven to zero. Ms. Snap. Item number eight. LDCT 2316 Ordinance 2404, a county initiated land development code text amendment, chapter two definitions, abbreviations, and acronyms. This is the first of two public hearings. It's presentations upon request. Should you need one, your presenter is Charles Andrews. Right, am I correct? This is the first reading, so there's no action needed, correct? Correct. County Attorney? Correct. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Knapp? <clears throat> no need, I don't, it's the first reading, no need public comment? Yeah, thank you. Yes. If there's any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Thank you very much. Item number nine, ZL 2314, Cahill 37th Street East Rezone. This is a rezone of approximately two and a half acres, generally located approximately 700 feet north of the intersection of State Road 70 and 37th Street East on the west side of 37th Street East. From agricultural suburban to general commercial limited zoning district, Subject to stipulations of approval as voluntary proffered by the applicant and including a schedule of permitted and prohibited uses attached as Exhibit B. This is presentations upon request. Should you need one, your staff presenter is James McDevitt. All right. Would there anybody like a presentation on this item? No. no. Seeing none, open the item up to public comment. And there's been no ex parte, I'm sure. Thank you. 
Uh, can I get a, I have a motion by Commissioner Satcher, a second by Commissioner Turner. Okay, if we can cast our votes now. And cast our votes. Everybody's voted, right? I'm waiting for the all vote to come up. Is. And the item carries 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Knapp. Next one. Item number 10, PDMU 2227P, Gettle Genesis of Lakewood. This is a preliminary site plan for vehicular sales, rental, and leasing for property zoned plan development mixed use coastal high hazard on approximately 3.6 acres, generally located on the north side of State Road 64, approximately 600 approximately 650 feet east of 57th Street, Morgan Johnson Road. This is presentations upon request, and should you need one, your staff presenters, Loretta Merrill. Would anyone like a presentation? No. There's been no ex parte. At this point, I'll open up for public comment. If there's any public comment regarding this item, seeing none, I'll close public comment. I have a motion by Commissioner Satcher, a second by Commissioner Ballard, and I'll vote at this time. And item carries 7-0. Snap. Uh, Next, we move into presentation scheduled. Items 11 and 12 are going to be opened together. So I'll read both of them into the record at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Plan Amendment 2302, Ordinance 2412, Eden Ellington, small scale comprehensive plan amendment, map amendment. It's a privately initiated map amendment to element two, future land use, amending the future land use category for just over 30 acres, generally located approximately 580 feet uh, west from the intersection of 60th Avenue East and 29th Street East, Ellington, from residential six dwelling units an acre to residential nine dwelling units an acre. And item 12 is PDR 2305ZP, Eden Ellington. And this is the companion rezone of approximately uh, the same acres, just over 30 acres, from planned development mixed use and suburban agriculture to planned development residential yes. and approving a preliminary site plan for 259 unit project consisting of multifamily residential units, generally located as described in the previous item. And uh, Rosina is handing out a uh, public comment that was received after we published the agenda yesterday. All right, thank you, Ms. Snap. This, these items have been read together, but they will be voted on separately. Correct. Mr. Chair. Th yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, the applicant has requested that the two items be heard separately. Um, that is your decision as to whether we hear them together or separately. I'll rely on the county attorney to help me respond to that. Hey, Mr. Chair, I recommend you hear them together and so you'll be fully informed of the whole project before voting on either one. All right. We'll hear them together. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Linda Stewart with Morris Engineering representing the applicant. And we, I have separate presentations since I thought we would do them separately, so I'll go through the comp plan amendment first, and then I'll, I'll give the zoning application. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. Uh, this is for Eden Ellington. It's a small-scale comprehensive plan amendment request. The property is located west of the intersection of 60th <coughs> Avenue East and 29th Street East, um, just east of I-75. It's a compilation of nine separate parcels. And the, I won't read all the PID numbers for you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, the future land use request change is from RES 6 to RES 9, which would change the density request from six dwelling units per acre to nine dwelling units per acre. Um, this is an infill development that's compatible with the surrounding uses and consistent with the comp plan policies. Um, as you can see, there is a RES 9 in Ellington Cove, just to the west of I-75. There's also a large area um, to the east with Ridgewood um, Oaks and Ridgewood Mobile Home Park. And an MU future land use just to the south with the ice rink and the Ellington Mall. Uh, the existing zoning is PDMU and A1. Uh, we are requesting a zoning change to PDR, which is consistent also. Uh, for this infill development around um, Tuscany Lakes Apartments, Oakley Subdivision, uh, which are all also zoned PDR, as well as the PDMU to the south. 
the request is compatible with the comp plan policies of 2.2.1.13.1, as well as 13.2 and 13.3, with the range of density being with the maximum gross residential density of nine dwelling units per acre. Um, again, the request is from RES 6 to RES 9 which would allow a maximum of 272 dwelling units per acre on the property. The development is adjacent and directly to the north is Tuscany Lakes Apartments and development adjacent and directly to the south is Springs of Ellington, uh, which is approved for 348 multifamily units. Um, it has a comparable density to the proposed request to the adjacent developments. Uh, this is a development map um, on the Man from Manatee County showing existing developments surrounding this infill request. This is a table showing um, the different subdivisions that I've named as well as their zonings and their densities uh, with 350, 348, um, 532 multifamily units. Uh, this infill development is discourage, discouraging urban sprawl by concentrating a more urban form, maximizing the use of existing infrastructure, the timing of the potential development being an infill. Uh, county operated and maintained public infrastructure is existing to the property, and there is uh, uh, Manatee County area transit available at the Ellington Mall just to the south. <coughs> On the environmental, we do have a small wetland area that will be impacted. Uh, there's 1.14 acres of streams and waterways, a reservoir, uh, just 1.89 acres of disturbed lands. There's one inactive bald eagle nest located within 660 feet. Uh, it's been noted by the Audubon Society that this nest was destroyed, but it's not listed on the Florida Fish and Wildlife site. Uh, Osprey has been, have been noted utilizing the off-site cellular tower nest. There's no development constraints expected with this, and um, the property has been surveyed for all on-site species. We propose that, the, that this request is consistent with the comp plan with 2.1.1, 1.2, and 1.4, as noted. Uh, the, in a, in accordance with policy 2.1.2.7, we've reviewed all the proposed development for compatibility and appropriate timing of development. And we think the property is consistent with the request from RES 6 to RES 9 with the adjacent developments in the area. This does limit urban sprawl. And we believe that the property is consistent with comprehensive plan RES 9 future land use category. The infill development is compatible with the surrounding developments. And the project does not adversely affect the general health, safety, and welfare of the general public. And that is our presentation for the future land use request. Before we go any questions to the applicant, as is there any, any ex parte on this item? Yes. Thank you very much. I see no one on the <clears throat> I see no one on the board for any questions. Um, any questions of the applicant? All right. Thank, um, thank you. You're welcome. Staff. Staff, you're up. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to hear the second item what, you together. To, you want to hear the second item now? Yeah. Yeah. Four yeah, staff, yes. Let's just have to bring the second item. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. A little rusty. I can do that. <laughs> okay. Again, Linda Stewart with Morris Engineering representing the applicant. I have been sworn. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that the first time. For Eden Ellington. Uh, PLN 2210-0069 for the rezone and PDR 23-05ZP. The, again, the location map is at the northeast corner of I-75 and 29th Street East, compilation of nine parcels. 
This is a request to rezone from PDMU, which is 4.38 acres, and A1 of 25.86 acres to PDR, along with a preliminary site plan approval for 259 multifamily residential units with an amenity center. Of that 259, 227 will be cottage homes, which are one-story detached homes, and 32 townhomes. The concurrent comprehensive plan amendment is a request from RES 6 to RES 9, which will allow the 259 multifamily units. The size is 30.24 acres. Uh, the current requested density is 8.56 dwelling units per acre, and it is located within the entranceway. Uh, we do have four specific approval requests, the first being from the uh, requirement in the entranceway for the 75% of all trees exceeding the 24-inch DBH, uh, native as a mitigation measure, native habitat areas are proposed to include the greenbelt buffer areas, maintaining existing canopy trees within these areas to the greatest extent possible. Um, from LDC 4026T3B, requiring 35% native habitat within the open areas to allow the utilization of the greenbelt buffer areas to achieve the required native habitat area requirement. Uh, in addition to the 1.89 acres of upland habitat preservation, the 2.24 acres of restoration will equate to a total of 4.13 acres of preserved and restored upland habitat, exceeding the required 3.17 acres. From LDC section 1005-3B for parking space calculation, to allow the total of parking spaces to exceed the 10% of minimum 1.8, to allow the total of 466 spaces to allow 548 spaces at a ratio of 2.12 spaces per unit. This will allow for visitation as well as workers um, coming to the area. Uh, and from LDC 906B2, requiring properties with the entranceway to interconnect to allow the deletion of this request since adjacent properties are existing, developed without the ability to provide cross access. Uh, this is the zoning map of the area. As you can see, to the north, to the east, we have existing PDR zonings. To the south, we have PDMU. Our, our request for PDR is consistent with the adjacent properties. The future land use map um, showing that our request from RES 6 to RES 9 is compatible and goes with the development pattern from west to east within Manatee County. Uh, this is another development uh, map showing this infill development surrounded by the um, existing developments that are being constructed and are in place in this area. This is 29th Street East. Um, as you can see, springs at Ellington are located on the south side of the road. Um, the project is on the east side. The first photo is at the west end of the street. The bottom photo is down at, toward I-75 with Eden Ellington Mall on your left-hand side. This is the site plan proposed for the development. Um, the townhomes are two-story homes. As you can see, those are the orange buildings. They are located interior to the development. Um, they are next to the clubhouse as well as um, closer to I-75. The cottage one-story buildings are all surrounding the perimeter of the property, so adjacent to any existing subdivisions, they are one-story buildings. Um, they have a required 30% open space. They are providing 36% open space. We also have along I-75 a 200-foot setback for the sound buffer. Um, a sound study was completed for this property showing that the limitations for the 65 um, dBH or for the decibels was reached at this point at 200 feet. So all buildings have been set back beyond the 200-foot space that would require any mitigation according to Manatee County Code if they were any closer. Uh, they do have a focal point with the um, clubhouse and amenity center. 
they have the, for buffers, they have the 200 foot sound buffer along I-75, a 20 foot roadway buffer and proposed landscape easement along the south property line, 15 foot greenbelt buffer and proposed landscape easement along the north and east, and a 20 foot entranceway roadway buffer along the west. They have two access points on the one roadway, uh, which is the county maintained of 29th Street East. The westernmost access is a full access drive. The easternmost access is ingress only for residents and for emergency access. There's an existing four foot sidewalk along 29th and they are proposing five foot sidewalks along both sides of the internal access ways which will connect with the offsite sidewalks. This is a boundary survey of the property. This was done in May of last year. Um, we did have a neighborhood meeting and the neighbors were concerned about the access along the eastern side of the property, um, that there is an easement that is 25 feet on this property and 25 feet on the Oakley subdivision property, which is um, delineated on this blow up of the survey. It shows it as 56th Street East. Um, the 25 feet that is located on the eastern side of our property also goes up and wraps around the northern part of this one lot. Currently it's, I have a photo of it, it's, an, it's a dirt drive that's accessing one of the single family homes on one of the lots that is part of this development that will be removed. We do plan to ask for a vacation of this easement. Um, this shows the aerial photo kind of shows where the drive is going up and around and services the one house over to the west. And that's a photo of what the existing uh, drive looks like at the present time. This is a blow up of the plat for Oakley subdivision indicating the 25 feet of the 50 foot easement that is located on their property, which we, will, we do not have any intent to bother. Uh, they also have a 25 foot ingress egress easement that's located at the western end of their property as, lo as noted as item C. That again, we will not be bothering. This is a deed that's describing um, the 25 feet that is located on the Eden Ellington property. And again, the environmental as I discussed with the comp plan amendment. There's existing utilities on 29th Street. There's an existing 10 inch water main, an existing four inch force main with no reclaim available. Uh, for the proposed stormwater, we have an existing pond in the southwest corner. It's not included in the open space calculation. Um, and it is located within the government hammock drainage area. Traffic report was done by Kimley Horn and Associates in September. Uh, the estimated traffic trip generations is 89 trips in, 62 trips out, with a total of 151 peak hour trips. No concurrency related transportation improvements are required due to the project's trip generation potential. However, the applicant is providing improvements to the intersection of 60th Avenue East and 29th Street East. They are proposing to provide a traffic signal, a northbound left turn lane, a northbound right turn lane, a second southbound through lane, and a southbound left turn lane with a potential cost of $6 million um, for the developer. Um, that will be discussed further in just a moment by Kimley Horn. We believe that the de development is in compliance with the Land Development Code, Sections 402 and 402-4A for PD regulations. It's consistent with the Comp Plans RES Future Land Use Category Policy 2.1, oops, excuse me, 2.2.1.13. Um, RES 9 is for areas of medium density residential and complementary support uses for this infill development and we believe the project does not adversely affect the general health, safety, and welfare of the public. And I will have um, Kimley Horn come up and give you a little bit of information rega um, in regard to the improvements at the intersection. Thank you. Uh, 
Good morning, commissioners. My name is uh, Bob Grusa with Kim Lee Horn. Uh, I have been sworn, and good to be back here. I think <clears throat> some, some people know me. I actually worked here at the county. I was a transportation planning manager about a decade ago. Uh, so I'm very familiar with what's going on here on this, I mean, especially public works. Um, what I'm going to do now is kind of a back a little bit, if you don't mind, is as, uh, as we were talking about the presentation about the um, improvements that we were talking about. During the review process, working with county staff, they approached us, even though as you saw that, there was no concurrency related improvements required for the project. Public Works staff approached us about, uh, about participating and helping them, working with them, on maybe looking at improvements at the intersection of 60th and 29th. And I know this section's funny because when I was here at the county, we were talking about the improvement of 60th a decade ago, uh, and finally it's moving forward. But anyway, through that whole process, um, especially after discussions with, with the client and the applicant, we had come up with an agreement with the county to do improvements at that intersection. You saw some of the improvements that we were making to that. I kind of wanted to show you kind of a bigger picture of how that fits in to the bigger scope of 60th Avenue, if you don't mind. Now, I'm gonna put one down here, and it's too small. I've been this through this before. You may not be able to see it, so I'm gonna give you individual ones. This young lady will help me. Let's see if this goes here. If you wanna pass that enough copies for everyone because it really may be hard to see that that's not exactly been through this before it's an aerial sketch of a layout of old 60th quarter basically taking it from 301 northward to Buffalo where it ends you could actually see it better when you see it live like that that 11 by 17. I try to blow it up as best as possible. But it's different colors, as you can see, color-coded. I just want to make sure. As you can see, I broke it up in different sections. Thank you very much. The, the blue section, as you can see, is from 3 one I'm going to go from south to north on this. So from 301 to actually the, the factory shops, Boulevard, or the outlet center, that whole thing that's in blue right now, that is uh, under design and will be improved from a four lane to a six lane section by the county. From that point, you can see what's in green, going to, I'll say approximately the Palm Grove is another project by the county that's under design that they're improving it from two lanes to four lanes. And then you see people are kind of like a lighter blue for that point northward. That's a section that actually we're working with the county uh, and it, kind of in a cost sharing agreement, by the way, as we move forward, is actually continue that four lane through up to and maybe a little past 29th Street intersection, that point. Okay, and one of the things too is important too is again, there's a traffic signal turn lanes. So what we're gonna do is carry the four lanes working with the county to the intersection and then taper it back down back after north of 29th to a two lane section. And then we see that in white is remaining as a two lane section at the moment until county funds, et cetera. And then you can see the kind of the orange color for the north is that extension of, we call it 60th or Buffalo, all the way that's, under, that's actually under design. And I think it's, if I'm wrong, uh, actually county staff can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's likely be under construction this year, that extension, two lane extension all the way to the southern terminus. So that's where we are. So we're kind of working with the county on trying to improve this whole corridor as a better flow, traffic flow, and also to work through the hot spots or the locations of concern. Like there was some concern about 29th Street intersection. That's why we had agreed with county staff uh, about going ahead and put a traffic signal there, among everything else, and all the turn lanes that we talked about. So if anyone has any questions, I just wanted to share that with you as we go forward. And we are still working with the county to finalize the agreements and everything else going forward. Thank you, sir. Um, we have one commissioner on the board, Commissioner Turner. Hey, Bob, thanks for the presentation. <clears throat> Overwhelmingly, when we increase density on these things, same thing when I was on Planning Commission, the two main concerns from constituents are the traffic, <clears throat> excuse me, 
and uh, you know, flooding mitigation and things like that. But this this particular case, I would say the overwhelming comments are traffic. And so with these plans, with the, the additional turn signal or turning lanes and signals, so you anticipate, and with working with the county, you don't anticipate any additional bottleneck to what's existing. It should it free it up even further from where it is right now. There are, do you, do you predict, or that's hard to say? I'm just estimating, but working with the county, that's why we created those <clears throat> those lanes, additional turn lanes, and each, actually through lanes right. to actually minimize that, that flow. Uh, and to minimize, I should say, congestion and increase the flow of, of it. So we're working cl closely with the county public work staff so to, to answer that is, is we're not anticipating that it's supposed to, these, these improvements will definitely help us to build out of a project but beyond. And that's why county staff has asked us for actually additional turn lanes to, to actually, if you don't mind me saying the analogy, if sometimes a roadway segment fails, it's not because of the segment itself, it's the endpoints. Right. And in this case, 29th can be considered an endpoint, Mendoza, if you want to call it an endpoint, and a lot of times, uh, both of those locations are being improved, as well as further south. If you improve those endpoints, it's like thinking of a rubber band ex uh, expanding out. You could extend the life of the roadway itself and increase the flow. And also, these turn lanes are helpful also for surf safety reasons, too. Not just a capacity, really, but also imp improve or, you know, the safety conditions. Right. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I would say that's the overwhelming concern on this project is is the traffic piece. That's a good explanation. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz. Can you, I, I don't remember which one of you put it up. I, I, I mean, um, you had the list of the various uh, improvements you're going to do, you know, going back to the, tra the traffic, uh, the left turn lane, the, the, the right turn lane, and so forth. I'm looking through my packet. And, They'll have to put the presentation back up. Oh, thank you. Oh, this was the comp plan. We need the zoning one. Yeah. Oh. And I think it was specific was it to turn lanes right, right. Yeah, it was right, left, right intersection. Left and signal. Right. Just pull it up. No, I know she put it up. I can't find it in ours. There you go. There you go. All right. I mean, here's here, here's my question. It's Bless the you. problem with any of our these, these traffic studies. That I, I I don't think they're actually accurate. Uh, these all have to do the way I'm looking at it. For the most part, these all have to do with 29th more so than 60th. Correct. I mean, our, our the analysis you're running is how do you get your people out of 29th faster, it doesn't really answer the question of what happens when they do. Um, 60th is arguably one of the most failed roads in Manatee County. Uh, what happens when you when they use that extra northbound turn lane or, or right turn lane or, or, or you know, the, the intersection? Once you get on 60th, you're stuck. I mean, today, it takes four light cycles to get through when you're going south towards 301 it, it, it'll take me four light cycles to get through that without all of this. I mean, we, we, we kind of almost, not almost, we, we, we over-approved a lot of stuff there uh, relative to the two apartment complexes, the, the, the property across the street, and, and it is what it is. Those are moving forward. Some of them had affordable housing components, so they had a little bit of a benefit getting done. This is not only a lot of units, but you actually ask for more parking with the anticipation of more cars. Um, I don't see how they result in 80-something trips. I mean, with the, uh, this is a lot of units. But again, 29th is terrible, uh, but 60th is worse. Um, 29th is what it is, but, and the reality is a lot of your people, I'll, I'll be honest, my, my kid plays hockey at the rink. I'm there endlessly. Uh, a lot of people are just going to start cutting through that parking lot. You're, what you're going to end up having is a bottleneck in the middle of the outlet parking lot while we're dealing with that because – if I lived in this new place you're building, I would never take 29th. I don't care how many left turn lanes and right turn lanes you build me. I'm cutting through that parking lot, and I'm going to wait for that light down there uh, to try to get out because otherwise it's going to take you an extra 20 minutes. It's going to cut. So what what do you anticipate 
as the improvements to get people actually out of this area? I mean, it, it's an honest question, and I was waiting to, to talk to staff about it, and I will when they come up, if you'd rather me defer it. But the Commissioner Turner brought it up, so I just figured I'd at least give you a shot before I asked our staff. Because I honestly, I know this area very well, and it's terrible now. Like, right this minute, it's impossible. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's worthless. You, you can't get any place. If you put an extra 300 units plus or minus in here, uh, and we're trying to come up with a way of saying, okay, it's it's R6, but I'm going to make it R9 just to squeeze an extra 90 units in here, which which crams an extra 100 and something cars in here. You're just making the problem worse. So what, what's your thoughts on that relative to your understanding of you know the, the county, your understanding of, of your traffic study, and what's your intended improvements to do? How do I get people on and off 60th once you get them on there? Okay. Good questions. I uh, appreciate it, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, for the, for the record, for the uh, traffic study itself, it's funny because you have to go through certain guidelines and, and follow procedures from Manatee County. Uh, ironically, I wrote the standards 13 years ago on this whole uh, traffic study in terms of the guidelines of doing the traffic study because I've been doing it for many, many years when I was there at the, at the county. But neither here nor there, uh, we did use the standards about you know, how much traffic. Now, regarding the turn lanes, it's interesting you bring that up because we actually sat down with Mant the public works staff and tried to lay out the improvements. And they were concerned about 60th, and that's why some of the improvements that are on there, you see most of them are north and south. It was specifically to improve traffic flow along 60th. So that. And, and for the, the turn lanes and the through lanes and things like that, this was not. This was a, a list that we came up with 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 Public Works, and they had come back and said we would like you to do these improvements to help the flow going north and south. Now it's in concert with the other improvements to the south. That's the important thing. If this was just isolated in itself, it helps this location, but it may not help the others. That's why the whole thing about 301 going northward is important. It ties in hand in hand with what the county is trying to do, improve that entire corridor. All right, I'll, I'll talk to staff. I'm not gonna put you on the spot, I'll talk to them. Thanks. You good, Commissioner Cruz? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, staff, you ready, Bill? Yes, sir. Good morning, commissioners. Um, for the record, I'm Bill O'Shea with Development Services, and I have been sworn. So we are, the first part of it is the Comprehensive Plan Amendment. I'll be discussing that with you. I only have a few more points to add. The, the applicant did a really good job of describing the request, and then I will be turning it over to Ms. Rosina Leiter, who will discuss the preliminary site plan with you. We're gonna go through these sides really quickly because a lot of them are duplicative. So this is the site. Um, it's currently designated as Res 6. The request is to go to the Res 9 future land use classification. Um, as you can see on the map, um, there ha is some Res 9 that was established on the northwest side of the site. Um, that's the Ellington Cove approval. Um, and you have mixed use to the south, which, as you had heard earlier with Amaro, would, could potentially allow up to 30 dwelling units per acre should the ice arena go away and they decided to develop it with, um, with housing. So staff, from a transitional st a standpoint, felt that there was a transition from that mixed use um, to the Res 9 and to the Res 6. Um, the A1 and PDMU land or zoning designations appear to have been done in 1990 with the adoption of the, land, of the 1990 Land Development Code and the Res 6 Future Land Use Classification was um, designated in 1989 with the Comprehensive Plan and those have remained unchanged up till this, this request. Uh, the applicant already showed you surrounding development. Um, as was indicated earlier, this is uh, nine separate sites that total about 30.25, I think it is, acres. Um, public facilities that will be serving the site, the schools are Blackburn Elementary, 
Buffalo Creek Middle, Palmetto High School. There is transit in the outlet mall. Um, the parks are Buffalo Creek, approximately four miles northeast of the subject property. This is a map showing utilities in the area. Uh, the positive aspects, Res 9, um, appears to be a logical transition given the emergence and emerging development trends in the area. The subject site is considered an info project. The site is located west of the FDAB where development is encouraged and public utilities and infrastructure are available. Staff felt like this was an appropriate request and did not identify any negative or mitigating factors for the comp plan amendment. So in conclusion, the request can be found to be consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comp plan. This is a small scale comprehensive plan amendment. So today the request is for adoption. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Van Osterbridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My questions are gonna be directed towards traffic. Um, so I don't know if you wanna bring Nelson or Denise up. Sure. And before I got started, Mr. Chair, if you would just allow me a, a quick point of privilege to just address the folks in the audience whose concerns are probably gonna be similar to the district commissioner who's sitting next to me grimacing in his chair as he's listening to the presentation. Um, and they're gonna be about they're gonna be about traffic, but just to understand the, the playing field and how we got here, there it's not urban sprawl. It is essentially infill because the area is already residential all around it. There's commercial near it. Um, there's adequate schools, as was pointed out, there's not a more than adequate park nearby. So we're down to traffic, right? And we all understand the challenges on 60th. Um, your district commissioner lives right there. I mean, he, he knows it as well as you do. He's, he's your neighbor. Um, but the spirit of the law is that the, the road, which is a, essentially a failed road, as was pointed out, that is the responsibility of the government, which is us. It is not necessarily the responsibility of the applicant. So that has to be taken into consideration up here. And so my question then, leading into my question for staff, is can you please lay out for all these folks and us, we should pretty much know this, but can you lay out what is the plan, the long range plan for 60th, and can you include in it to the best of your ability some timelines, like the intersection at 301, you know, and, and lay out what is the long, ter the long term vision for 60th and we'll give us some basic timelines. Basic timelines. We'll hold you to the nearest 24 hours, you know. <laughs> And, and I, my, my objective here is to give you all as much information as I can before public comment so that when you come up here for public comment, you're, you're armed with as much knowledge as we can give you on the project and on the traffic flow and the, the traffic plans. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Nelson Galeano, Transportation Planning, Traffic Engineering here at Development Services, and I have been so um, Let me start. Uh, Nelson, can we please ask you to speak up a little bit better into the mic and then okay. slow down a little and bit? And slow down. You're getting paid hourly. Take your time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, some, sometimes I know I speak louder than normal people. Okay. Um, let me start with the, with the trip generation uh, because that is an important point. Uh, normally, uh, people associate uh, trip generation with the number of cards, um, and really it's not the trip generation is associated with socioeconomical information, it follows socioeconomical data. The higher the income, the higher the mobility pattern and, the, and higher the, the number of trips on the roadway uh, because there are more possibilities to use more cards. Um, in this context, uh, uh, the Institute of uh, Transportation of Engineers use uh, the number of, the, the type of dwelling units to estimate the trip generation. Uh, for this case, uh, we have about 150 trips during the PM peak hour, which is not related with the number of parking and the number of cars that each Delwin unit has. Uh, please, uh, it, that is a, a, a clarification that you need to, 
to state here uh, at the beginning because it was one of the main concerns uh, during the um, uh, meeting with the planning commission. And, uh, in order to explain what happened on this area, I want, I want to, to use this, uh, our map five series, uh, and I want to show uh, more or less where is located our project. This is uh, about, uh, if you see here, it's uh, on, on the point of, uh, of the pencil. Um, as you see, this is a white area. There are, there are so few roads. What I wanna say is uh, this area of the county uh, lacks connectivity and accessibility. And this is the consequence of how the territory has been developed. Uh, and we need to face this condition. Um, that is the reason uh, 60 and 301 is uh, heavily congested. This is, uh, and besides we have a uh, Ellington Mall, which is a heavy attractor of trips, uh, and it, 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 com it is a complicated area. Um, to, to address the, and, and probably works and development services, we recognize this uh, condition, and, and we thought uh, in how to solve this, uh, this challenge in two different ways. The first is uh, the short term and the long term. And let me go with the short term, essentially the, the the intersection uh, on 60 and 29th, uh, the connection with uh, Buffalo, and, and the potential improvements that um, FDOT uh, will be doing on 60 due to the impact area interchange improvements uh, along uh, I-75. It means uh, it's not only a problem that uh, the county recognizes, it's also a problem that uh, FDOT has uh, part of, and, 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 and that, is, that is the short-term um, uh, approach. Um, again, connectivity, in this case, north-south, uh, through from 301 to Mocasingualo via Buffalo 60. Okay, long-term, uh, the situation is a little bit different, uh, essentially because we know that 29th, uh, uh, this is also, uh, say, in bad shape, and this is uh, adjacent, the project is adjacent to I-75, which uh, in other words, um, cut the territory. Uh, the idea is to, to do the overpass uh, above uh, uh, 29 for the uh, 2045, and it will solve uh, the problem between east and west, and it alleviate the condition on US 301. Uh, in, that, in that way, the intersection be, uh, on 301 and 60, will, will the, the operational conditions on the intersection 301 and 60 will be better, essentially because uh, the implementation of the overpass. Um, as is on the uh, long range transportation plan, um, there are no decisions how to do with this uh, overpass, uh, but we believe based on the modeling efforts um, that uh, uh, it contributes to mitigate uh, the pressure that uh, this area has um, because of the lack of uh, connectivity and accessibility. In terms of timing, uh, the project, um, we have a capital improvement plan project um, and the uh, schedule activities uh, for the construction, for, to finalize the construction, as is a uh, December 25, um, and the idea is to uh, get connectivity uh, between the intersection 29th and 60 to Buffalo and, and, and have connection north-south, a, a continuous connection north-south. Um, that is one thing. The other thing is, uh, uh, of course, the, the works, uh, the construction works, the roadway improvements. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the cost of the um, extension to Buffalo uh, is about $25 million. Mm, again, November, December 25. Let's go with the, with the roadway improvements uh, uh, along um, uh, 60 between 301 and, and the uh, uh, out mall, uh, outlet mall. Um, the idea is to finish uh, the project uh, 
uh, on September 25, and the cost of these improvements is about uh, $15 million. It means uh, uh, easily, uh, this is uh, an investment of $40 million to, to uh, mitigate the situation uh, between 301 and Buffalo uh, along 60th. Okay. Uh, of course, the, the intersection on 60 and 29 plays an important <laughs> role. Uh, there are some technical uh, challenges with uh, transition areas between uh, four lane and two lanes. Um, the idea is also to improve non-motorized travel, having uh, the possibility for bicyclists and pedestrians. It means it will be sidewalks and, and bicycle paths. Um, we believe that this is the best way to challenge, uh, to, to face the challenge of um, lack of connectivity uh, on this area of the county. So quick, quick review. I did not hear your, I think you said it, but I missed it, the estimated start date for the intersection of 301 and 60th. 301 and 60. Um, that's an F dot. Oh, that is an FDOT project. Correct. Yes, sir. Do we have a start date for that yet? Yeah. I, yes, it means uh, the summer. what? Summer of 2024. Summer of 24, that intersection starts. Okay. That's what starts. I knew that was coming. I know that we've, I believe we've acquired all of our right of way already we for that intersection. We still have a little it's bit to finish. Okay. Denise Greer for staff. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just found out from Public Works there's a few pieces that we have not Hold quite up. finished acquisition on. Okay. Um, but the construction for that section of 60th that we have plans for should start summer of um, 2024. Okay, so 2024 will start on that intersection. And I, I've seen some plans for it. That yes. intersection will be blown wide open. I mean, we're, we're per we've acquired significant right of way in the shopping center to the north, I guess, would it be, well, the east it would be. It'll be six lanes from 301 to Factory Shops Boulevard. And then the graphic that Kim Lee Horn show, showed you was a little off. It's gonna transition four lanes to 26th Street East, which is the entrance into Bougainvillea Place. Okay. So it doesn't go quite as far, but there'll be a transition from and four lane to two lane in that area. Okay, and so then you're running we're running two lanes from, from Bogan, I love Bougainvillea Place. From there all the way to Moccasin Wallow, we would be connected, but two lanes the whole way, correct? Yes, yes. The idea is to have four lanes depending on okay. how, is, how is the traffic. And on that break. connection, the groundbreaking is planned for December of 25. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, oh, that's completion. Completion, yes. Well, that's completion. even better. See how I set you up for completion. success on no, that? We, the, the, the land, the, <laughs> The, the, this, it means the land acquisition should finish uh, last year. Okay. And and the construction, the construction, the construct the end of the the, the construction okay. is on November December twenty five. December of twenty five completion. That's a nice Christmas present. And then in in the long term, we are working with F dot for an overpass at twenty ninth to take you over the interstate. That is correct. And that's like a twenty forty five and twenty forty five. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the day it's going to happen, but we have a, a long-range plan, which we basically call our 2045 plan. So the ideas will be complete before then. When it falls exactly in there is, is still up in the air. You know, when can we acquire funding and right-of-way, that sort of thing. Um, okay, I, th I think that lays it out pretty well, and that was what I was trying to do is, you know, give these folks some really important basic information on, on what, because we have big plans. Commissioner Satcher has been working hard on it, and and there are big plans and it is coming it just it takes a minute to get it done and it's a lot of money tens of millions um and unfortunately you have to take property from folks along the way and that's never pleasant but uh, for the greater good in the end that's all for me mr chair thank you i, thank you I just that. wanted to clarify if i could yes ma'am some of the information that we have from public works because of information that they just sent me that some of the land hasn't been acquired yet their dates are going to be pushed a little bit more. So it may not be a Christmas present 2025. It may be. I've already made the promise. So <laughs> by being a New Year's that's Eve why, present. That's why I was trying to interject. <laughs> well, Kwanzaa's the next day, so we could right. give them Kwanzaa. Do we anticipate much um, resistance on the, those acquisitions, or are they moving? <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. That'll be a public works question. OK. That's it. Anybody have any questions for Nelson? Thank you.
Mr. Chair, now I'm going to turn it over to Rosina to go over the site plan. Thank you. Good morning, Rosina Lade and has been sworn. Um, I don't going to go and repeat part of the information. I would like to move on to some. Um, uh, give me a second. to um, some important subjects. Might be a lot of it's not? Uh -huh. not okay. Um, is to recap, the, the application is to rezone the site from a PDMU that is for four acres and A1 that is 25 to PDR and a proposal for 259 multifamily units and the form of um, cottage and attach units, but are multifamily. There are four specific approvals, one related to the flexibility for uh, the removal of more than 25% of the trees with 24 inches DBH in the entrance way. The other one is the preservation of native uh, plant communities the elimination of the cross access easement that is requiring the entrance way and the increase the number of parking spaces. And this is the area, and uh, it's important to say that to the north and east, the site is surrounded by uh, residential developments. To the north is Toscany Lake, that is a multifamily development, and to the east is Olay Place. And to the south, there is multifamily in the way of um, Ellington, um, Spring Ellington, that is right now uh, named Water, Watermark, and was approved for 348 uh, family units, plus 125,000 square feet of commercial. What is uh, right now in under construction is the multifamily units, and also to the southwest uh, is the um, outlet mall, the ice rink. And this is the future land use category that is requested to REST 6 that uh, give the maximum number of units of 272. And like I said, they are proposing 259. And that the site is almost entirely with the entranceway. Um, I'm talking about the um, surrounding uses. And this is the site plan. And I would like only to point it like there are two access points, one to the west, that is the main access point that give access to the amenity center and after distribute the, the traffic internally. And a, a second mean of access that is to the east are along 29 that is only for uh, residents entering the site or emergency access. Um, the applicant is proposing a 200 feet buffer for sound mitigation and they have a noise story that was presented and determined that within the 200 feet sound buffer that include the 20 feet roadway buffer along the I-75, the site gonna comply with the, um, all the units gonna be located outside of the 65 decibels. That is the maximum that is allowed in the code. Like I says, all the units are multifamily, could be like, look like single family attached, and the other ones are cottage or a kind of village. And um, I go through this, and within that is with the um, growth pattern in the area, and provide transition from the more intense uses to the south, that is the outlet mall and the multifamily that is approved for 12 to 20 units per acre. And to the negative aspects, we mentioned that um, the units could be subject to noise provided from the I-75, but the applicant have the noise story. And uh, we support the specific approvals especially uh, the applicant is proposing more than the number of parking spaces that is required in the code, that is 1.70 over, 
and the maximum that we can approve administratively is 10%. The applicant justify because they have other properties that since this, you, this uh, development gonna act it of a single family, single family require two dwelling units, two parking spaces per dwelling units, plus the parking for the recreational facility and parking for uh, visitors. And we are in support of that. And with the cross access easement, there is no possibility to, create, to comply with that because to the east is already developed with the, to the east and the north is already developed with the um, residential subdivisions or multifamily complex. And to the west is the I-75. If you have any questions, I am here to respond anything. Uh, maybe uh, this coincides with the traffic thing. As far as we know, <clears throat> if this is approved today, how would it coincide with the timing of the road improvements as far as this project starting and getting going? This is a question for transportation, <laughs> the uh, road improvements. Well, I mean, we've kind of got timelines on that already, right? So we've got a start date, summer, end date, um, December 25. I've got those timelines. What about this this project? timing do we know uh, could be a question for the applicant when they are expecting to yeah, start. it's not his question I've got the answer thank you yeah maybe the applicant what, what uh, Commissioner Turner the applicant will get a chance to come back up and okay fair enough questions I'll ask we get them with public thank comment. you sure Regina, are, you, are you done <laughs> are you, Regina? no I'm not waiting for the <laughs> I apologize. Do you have any other questions? Does anybody else have any other questions of Rosie? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Normally we do at this point, we go to public comment, but we usually have a 1030 break. So what I'd like to do is just take a quick 10 minute uh, recess right now to get some folks a minute to take care of some stuff. So we'll be in recess till 1045. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, everybody, very much. We're back from recess. We just finished uh, applicant presentation, staff presentation, and now we're going to move into the public comment section for this item. Once again, if you, uh, we have nine speakers up right now. I'll call, call you in order. If you can come up, please state your name, county residence, and that you have been sworn, and you will get three minutes. Um, up first, and what I'll do is I'll call the first person and the second person, so the second person is going to be ready to come up. The first person on the list is uh, uh, Catherine Nelson. Catherine Nelson. Who runs before the law? Wait a minute. Jeez. Do you want the law? Yeah, let Patty go first. Oh, Patty, you want to go first? Yes, sir. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. You were last on the list, so that's why I didn't call well, you. Well, that's because <laughs> the machines didn't check me in right. I had to get technical help. Okay. And so they did it by hand or something. Thank you, Ms. Um, Petro. Good morning. My name is Patricia Petroff. I have been sworn. I represent the Oakley Homeowners Association. I submitted my letter to the clerk. Um, uh, my clients and I, and I submitted you all a letter. I gave it to you. I, on Tuesday, I gave you another one today. This sort of summarizes my comments. We have some concerns, concerns. I don't think there have been any change circumstances that would require you or mandate you to change this to Res 9. Um, I was part of the committee that helped draft the 1989 comp plan, which sadly means I've been here a really, really long time. The whole purpose of that comp plan what it, it has done exactly what it was supposed to do. The, there was supposed to be a major uh, center at the intersection of I-75 and US-301, State Road 64, I-75, uh, State Road 70, and University Parkway. That has all come to fruition. Your outlet mall is a little more popular than maybe some of the other ones, you know, University malls giving them a run for their money with traffic, but that outlet mall has exceeded expectations with traffic. And now everything else has started coming in line in your packet. You've seen this. I could put it down in the overhead if you need to look at it again. I think it's in your comp plan package. There is no Res 9 anywhere near. The closest Res 9 is on the other side of the interstate. That's really not comparable for discussion purposes. The, the, you do have mixed use, outlet mall, ice hockey rink. Yes, if that's ever developed, redeveloped, something more can go there than what's there now. But 29th Street, which is your little collector street, has been the boundary. Everybody else has managed to develop perfectly within Res 9. That was what was intended. That is what has happened. This is the last project. It can stay at Res 6. There's no change of circumstances that would mandate Res 9. And there are reasons for it to stay at Res 6. Proximity to the interstate, noise, noise. At one time in my career, I represented Creekwood, parts of Creekwood, Mr. Grimes, the elder, uh, represented more of Creekwood. I represented Terra since 1980. I've dealt with that noise issue on Terra. It's hard, it's hard. That 200 foot setback sounds good, but then they're putting the stormwater ponds right in that 200-foot setback. Noise carries over water. I live on the Braden River. I can hear, I live at 18th Avenue back on the Braden River on the east side. I can hear the cheers of the crowd from your park on State Road 70. Can't hear it 100% of the time, but I sure can hear it when that crowd gets excited over those softball games. That is almost two and a half, three miles from my house on the Braden River. 
I can always hear traffic and I'm just waiting to see how much more noise I get from 44th Bridge over the Braden River, which is a great bridge. I don't mind having that bridge, but it's going to bring more noise. So having those ponds there isn't going to help with the noise for those houses. My clients experience issues with 60th Avenue East, like everyone else. Their issues are slightly different because their only entrances and exits are on 60th Avenue East. Everybody blocks, blocks the box for them to turn. They get trapped in their subdivision. It takes them five cycles once they get out to get to 301. I doubt that they can ever turn north because nobody lets them. Whether or not the um, whether or not all the traffic improvements will help, I have no idea, but something needs to happen, and it doesn't need to happen with 90 more cars or 100 more houses, 90 more houses, whatever they're asking with the Res 9. That's not necessary. It's not needed. There was some discussion about the easement on the east side that uh, I understood uh, the applicant's planner to say they plan to vacate it. Just so you know, um, Leo Mills has researched it. There's a letter that I gave you today from Leo Mills. Um, my client uses that easement to gain access to their stormwater ponds for maintenance. And so, yes, there's some part of the easement is on some of their lots, but if we can't have that easement be vacated and we would object to that should that ever occur. On the survey submitted by the applicant, which I gave to the clerk, you have it in your package, what I highlighted in yellow, it says it's a public, 50 foot public right away. It's not. I think the applicant corrected that during their presentation. At best, it's, it, it's an easement for the lots we were one of the lots that got uh, subject to some of those easements. There are a lot of them. And right now the county has it listed as a private street with the color of the sign. With respect to other issues, one issue not to make it Res 9, it's in a flood prone area. Why would you add more units in a flood prone area? Now here is a little map which is a blow up of the Oakley subdivision. You will see this all over here is their stormwater retention and conservation area and you will see a very large public drainage system coming from the property that wants to go to Res 9 into Oakley. I don't see how that's being handled on the presentation made by the staff or, or by the applicant. But there's a large public drain from arguably that property into Oakley's property. And right now it has houses on top of it on the subdivision or the, the uh, PDR plan that you see. That's an issue that's a major concern for Oakley subdivision because it's like, okay, what's happening to all that water? Is it going to get pushed somewhere else on Oakley property? With respect to the design of the PDR, the design of the PDR, it's crowded. It's, it's you know, you, you have rules about PDR. We, we ignore them a lot these days. But a PDR is supposed to be a superior design. A PDR has to have, you know, focal points not on the collector road. Their focal point is on the collector road. It's supposed to uh, maintain more open space and more trees. So 25% of the trees that are 24 inches in breadth height are being removed. 25% of those trees. That's, you know, I can hardly put my hands around a tree that big. It's a big tree. It's a big tree. 
I'd like to know how many trees are part of that 25% and, what, and why can't they be preserved? And again, if you kept it at res six, would that mean that only 10% would need to be removed or 15% would need to be removed? I don't know. There's not a whole lot of green space. The green space consists of perimeter buffers, the stormwater ponds, and a little bit of green space along the side of one of the stormwater ponds and adjacent to I-75. Nothing really usable green space, which is what we'd like to see in a PDR. Um, it talks about design quality for your PDR in section 2.6 of your land development code. It says, shall generally be superior in design to conventional development site plans and consistent with all other factors. It's not superior in, in design. It's a crowded little place. With respect to the intent of PDR. Thank you, ma'am. Is that, did I only get 10 minutes? Because it's two items. Two you. items. Is that to the chair if you want to allow her to finish up? Um, if you could finish up. Quickly. Yeah, I'd love to finish up. All right, thank you. Um, I, on behalf of my client, I object to uh, approval of specific approvals number one and two, which is the trees and which is also the native species. I don't think you should grant those, you know, if, especially if you grant the Res 9, you shouldn't grant those. Why, you know, we have codes for a reason. I also would request that if you decide to do this to Res 9, that you require them to put a perimeter fence around my project, Oakley's open space, which is right adjacent to their project. I don't want Oakley, their residents to be using Oakley's open space as their own. I don't want trespass. Um, and again, the traffic issue is what it is. And if there's going to be road design, then something needs to be done to get these people out of their subdivision too, whether that's turn lanes or what, whether it's signs to say don't block the box, whether it's police officers there two times a month randomly giving tickets to the people who do block the box. Um, but I would respectfully request that you deny the Res 9 and then you ask them to come back with an appropriate site plan for the PDR at uh, number, uh, six units per acre. And I agree that it is a project that needs to happen. I have no problem with six units per acre and I have no problem the fact that it is infill. It is. It's the last piece. So obviously infill. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Catherine Nelson, and after her would be Dr. John Nelson. Ma'am, you have, please state your name, county residence, that you've been sworn, I am and that you have three Nelson. minutes. I'm Catherine Nelson. I have been sworn. I live in Manatee County. I live in Oakley, uh, which is the oldest neighborhood there. First one built uh, with a lot of green space, or bigger lots. <laughs> Um, I'd like to uh, agree with everything that our lawyer just said. She, she made brilliant the, the, the points that need to be made. Um, and I'd like to thank Commissioner Cruz for organizing that meeting at Rocky Bluff where the residents turned out there was standing room only people waiting in the hall to speak. And what these people said about development on 60th and what they said about the proposed revision to the comp plan which is in process number one item s prevent overdevelopment in this area and number two preserve some green space not totally against development but just controlled development two issues that i want to emphasize are traffic the traffic is now horrendous. I never know exactly how much extra time to, to leave when I'm going to a meeting or to choir practice. I was late to choir practice the other night, even though I'd allowed extra time. I, I used to have to get over to see mother and daddy. That's why I, I uh, am where I am. Um, 
I wanted to get over there to t check on them, elderly parents. It took 15 minutes. Now it takes 25. The, the traffic is horrendous, and adding more dense development is going to make it worse because we've got two developments right now that aren't even completed building that are still under construction. One is Marwood Pulte across right at the intersection of 60th and 29th. All those homes, a lot of them haven't even sold yet. They're still building them. That They demolished 18.75 dense uh, acreage there. Beautiful, huge old canopy trees to put that in right down to the dirt. The other uh, uh, development that's under construction is Palm Grove. Palm Grove, the apartment buildings, and they're still constructing and they're 50% they're rented out. So I understand there's traffic that, uh, improvements, but it's certainly not, what, it's already horrible. So this, you know, traffic's a problem. When are, when are these improvements gonna take place? And the other thing I just wanna definitely say, good, I've got time. <laughs> and I, I sent all of you um, and handed out printed copies so you can, if I'm not very eloquent because I'm a little nervous, you can know what I'm saying. Thank you, ma'am. The floodplain. Yes, ma'am. Flood Thank you very plain. much for your comments. I thought I had two minutes left. About three minutes. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Good Please morning. state your name. I'm John uh, Nelson. County I'm resident, you've been sworn. Of you three minutes. And I've been sworn. And um, I'd like to address this proposal from the standpoint of the health consequences for the neighborhood. I am a physician. I'm a certified, uh, board certified internist. My specialty is uh, preventive medicine. And I'd like to just read a brief comment from JAMA, the, one of the largest medical journals in the world, a lead editorial that just appeared six weeks ago because of their concern of the impact of overdevelopment on global health and the loss of biodiversity. And I'll leave this article with staff, but the part I want to read is as follows. Communities are healthier if they have access to high quality green spaces that help filter air pollution, reduce air and ground temperatures, and provide opportunities for physical activity. Connection with nature reduces stress, loneliness, and depression while promoting social interaction. These benefits are threatened by the continuing rise in urbanization and overdevelopment. So, I'm going to focus on two points. One's the stress, the other's the air pollution. I cannot go east on 31st where I live and try and take a lift left on 60th going north because it's extremely dangerous. There's a slight bend in the road, traffic comes around. So I go around 30th Street. And then I still have to look both ways because it's by lateral traffic. And what happens when you look both ways? If you're late for an appointment, you take chances. Right, you try and make a turn where you probably shouldn't. It causes accidents. It also increases your heart rate, your blood pressure, and you end up with hypertension or coronary artery disease. And you may think that's no big deal, but there are a lot of elderly people in our community and they already have hypertension, they already have stents in the coronary arteries. You increase the stress, it's going to have a very detrimental impact on their health. The other thing is air pollution. You may say, that's no big deal, we don't have heavy industry here in this area, what do we care about air pollution? If you have a child with asthma, or you have a relative that has uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, or if any of you are smokers, I will guarantee you that a 5% change in the quality of the air around here is going to make a huge impact on your quality of life. I go out, I try and ride five miles on my bike every weekend. I'm 82 years old. Every molecule of oxygen means a lot to me, okay? And if you take all those trees down, I'm going to be losing the filtering effect and uh, the oxygen supply. So, I think I'm out of time. Oh, actually, I've got uh, 20 seconds. Quality of life, that Palm Beyond is like a huge lake. We've got a very vibrant wild, uh, wildlife uh, 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 community there. It's a breeding ground for the wood stork, which according to the Florida wildlife community is the number one indicator of a healthy ecosystem. 
So I would strongly urge not to approve this increase in density or the increase in traffic. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. And you look good for your age, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, maybe tell them where the... Yeah. The tongue. Never looked at it. I don't know what the Up is. next is uh, Nan Mento? Minieto? Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. It's Minito. Oh, thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> My name is Nancy Minito. I've been sworn in. I'm a resident of Manatee County. Um, I just have a couple things to say. And if I could use this map that the county um, so graciously gave us. I don't know if it's very clear here. It's not very clear. I live on 30th Court East. 29th Street East is 50 feet from getting out on 30th. There's not a lot of room there. You put a light, I, I, I'm happy about the light, but I'm still not going to be able to make a left out. I'll rarely be able to make a right out of my street because if the light is on 29th, there's 50 feet, there's probably 10 cars sitting in front of me. And we all know traffic is a bad thing. Another thing is, since they started building on 60th, my water pressure is nothing. I turn on my spigot and I say, hmm. I called public works. I called in a plumber. It's not my problem. I'm not getting enough water. Talking about opening to Buffalo Valley Road or whatever, that's going to be a thoroughfare. They're going to go from 301 all the way over to Buffalo Valley. That is, and at our place, it's a two-lane road. From 29th to 32nd is a two-lane road. Cars whiz down there. Noise is horrible. And you're going to open it up, you're going to have more traffic coming from from them. Um, let's think what else I had to say. No, nope, that's all I had to say. Oh, and yeah. I would, I don't mind it being residential six. Um, I just need to see a perfect survey. I don't have one yet, so um, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Cynthia Taylor. Good morning, Mrs. Taylor. Good morning. Got another rule, my now. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Cynthia Taylor. I live in Oakley, and I have been sworn. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and County Commissioners. I would like to firstly inform you that I'm extremely opposed to this Eden Ellington project to be a Res 9. The reasons you've heard many, my biggest concern is the flooding and the traffic. So uh, the traffic, especially during the peak AM and PM hours, it's not uncommon for the traffic to be backed up all the way from 301 past my street, which is 31st. That's less than a mile. They're backed up, but it's a mile, almost a mile. It's just bumper to bumper. It's three quarters of a mile, sorry. The lined up cars have been sitting there waiting to get out. So they don't wanna let you in. Everybody's pushing and they block the street. One of our neighbors literally had to get out of their car, one of the people in the car, stop the traffic, stand and not let them go so that she could get out because she had an appointment. I had an appointment on 64th for nine o'clock. I left my house at eight o'clock and I reached that appointment at 10 after nine. I was late. That before all this, building went on with more wood and the um, apartments, Palm Grove. We have all this traffic coming from Parrish, from all the new developments there. So they line up on 301. They block that intersection. It's already six lanes when you turn. So we're going to go from six lanes to four lanes 
to two lanes in three quarters of a mile. Oh, sure, we're going to have turning lanes on 29th. That's not going to help anybody. It's just going to be a big bottleneck. Everybody's going to be trying to rush in. There's going to be a lot more accidents. I did contact the uh, Florida um, Highway and uh, Safety Motor Vehicle, and uh, they have not gotten back to me with how many accidents there were at the intersection of 301 and 60th and along 60th. That's all I asked for because that's what's impacting our neighborhood. They have not gotten back to me with a number, but they did have me go online if I could show this. There we go, it's, it's gonna be kinda hard to see. But the Florida Highway and Power, or Power, sorry, um, Safety, they patrol. This is for all of Manatee County last year. Thank you, ma'am. No. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to come forward and give additional public comment? Could you please come forward, sir? State your, state your name, county residence, and you have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is John Williamson. I live in Oakley um, on 60th. Two points, the traffic, which the commissioner basically mentioned, but forgot to mention a couple of other points. There's been five developments on 60th since we bought. There's been more developments down Mendoza and more to come. And more than thousands and thousands of houses down in Parish. What used to take me eight minutes to do 1.6 miles from my house to 75 can take me now 45 minutes. The point that was missing in the summary was, yes, all the traffic, but you forgot to mention Palm Grove. When Palm Grove is complete, there will be 800 residents plus there. That's 1,600 more cars as well as the 400 plus in Eden. That's 2,000 cars coming down 29th onto 60th. It doesn't make, matter if you make 60th four lane, 10 lane, it all comes to a screeching halt when you get 301. The other point I'd like to mention is about the drainage. I met with the um, original surveyor in 1997 to see why he was not uh, developing it any further. And he pointed out to me the name of the developer, uh, the name of the um, value was Michael Baker Associates. He did the survey, but it shows that the back of my house, there's a pond, retention pond, stormwater drainage and conservation drainage with the, all the wet pipes going into there. He told me he could not build it any further because it is waterlogged and there's a creek running through that development which is also flooding. So the whole area, when you stand at the top of the, um, my, where my pond is, you look down, there's about an eight foot drop. And these developers are on about bulldozing these trees down, doing landfill. I can't imagine what it's gonna do. But just the sheer impact of the traffic in that little area is gonna cause havoc. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You need to leave that with the, huh? you need to leave your survey with the clerk. Public record now. Public record, sir. Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. Else? Is there anyone else that would like to come forward on this matter and give public comment? Okay. Yes, ma'am, you were up here before, so you kind of know the. Okay. Um, my comment is that. Ma'am, can I, your name? Oh, Ida yeah. Fiorella. Um, at, 4602 Halls Mill Crossing in Ellington in Covered Bridge. Um, and you have been sworn. And I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, my comment is that the, de the development that's already been going on, for one thing, it's not even mentioning that the, most, the latest one that was approved was for another um, 235 units right behind the Ellington 
outlet mall. So that's like another, you know, probably another 470 cars that'll be coming out there. And um, talking about the need for an overpass over the throughway, over 75, you know, um, at 29th Street, 2045, that's like 23 years from now. So it seems like you need to wait till that's in place before changing the development, you know, in the area to increase the density. We're putting the cart before the horse. The roads and every the infrastructure needs to be in place first before all of that. So um, I'm really hoping that you take all of this into consideration um, before increasing uh, the development. And um, I guess that's that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else, sir? Everyone else, please state your name, county residence, and you have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, it was a good the clock's good right morning. there. You can <laughs> okay. okay. Good morning. My name's Cameron Beckham. I'm a resident of um, Manatee County. I was sworn in. I live right at the corner of 60th and 29th Street, and I have three children a 22 year old, a three year old, and a one year old. And we often hear the impact of very bad accidents. Uh, on many occasions, I've had to call 911 or emergency services because I'm laying in bed or we're out in the backyard and there's a crazy crash. There was just one there this past Saturday. Um, records indicate that there's been about 29, <clears throat> 29 accidents. I'm not sure over what time span, but I've been there five years and I've witnessed a number of accidents. Uh, so one of my biggest issues is going to be the traffic and how do we really mitigate that area to make it a little bit more safer. Um, as you've heard many people say before, it's hard to get in and out. Um, and then with, with the changes that are coming, how is that gonna affect me and my, my livelihood and my family's livelihood with adding more lanes? Like I think it's needed, but how does that impact our home? So that's one of the questions that I have. Um, yeah, I, I think if we could just figure out a way to really make that intersection a little bit more safer because it, I don't know if it's an issue with just people speeding because there are a lot of cars that speed through there uh, or is it also another issue with people not having sight and being able to see around the corner? I mean, just this past Saturday, there was a three-car accident. I think that's does it for me. All right. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Appreciate your comments. Would anyone else like to come forward on this matter in public comment? Ma'am, you already spoke, ma'am. I already spoke. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am, you can't. Thank you. With that, uh, with that, I'd like to close public comment. And um, any questions to the applicant, staff, or from the board? Don't see me. Don't see me on the board. Staff, closing comment. You get your, you get a rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't have any further comments. I just wanted to point out um, one thing in the comprehensive plan that it does talk about a change in development patterns as one of the reasons for requesting a comprehensive plan amendment. And I would argue that this area is developing given uh, recognizing the fact that there are some issues in this area, but the comp plan was written to allow for adjustments in the future land use classification as the county grows. And this is more centrally located in the county than what we're seeing as we push further and further east. So it is one way to, to try to help reduce um, urban sprawl. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is that in your comments? Yes. Thank you, sir. Applicant rebuttal. Hi, good, after, good morning, almost afternoon. Linda Stewart again with Morris Engineering representing the applicant. Um, I'll address a couple of the comments. The traffic will be addressed by the traffic engineer and uh, Mr. Merrill will um, also address a couple of the issues and Matt Morris, a civil engineer, can speak to you regarding some of the drainage questions that the residents have. Um, the, for the noise along I-75, 
as we stated previously, a, two, a noise study was done for the property, and according to Manatee County Code, if you have, you know, decibel levels of 65 or greater, um, you have to mitigate for that. We have mitigated by setting back all buildings 200 feet from I-75. We also have a 20-foot buffer along I-75, which also is a noise buffer and a visual buffer, in addition to the 200-foot setback. And according to code, if you're outside the 65 decibel noise level, additional mitigation efforts are not necessary. And if you note to the north with Tuscany Lakes, they are closer to I-75 with their structures than this, than this development is proposing. Um, the Oakley subdivision having access to their stormwater ponds, on their subdivision plat, they have a 25 foot easement for ingress and egress that does take them directly to their stormwater ponds. So whether this development chooses to um, vacate the 25 foot easement that's located on their property does not affect the access of Oakley subdivision having um, maintenance done on their stormwater ponds. Um, the compatibility with the overall area, this is considered a multifamily, but these are townhomes and cottages, which is compatible with the single family detached residential um, homes that are on, in Oakley. And it does show a good transition. We go from, you know, the multi-use, which allows, you know, 30 dwelling units per acre to the south, if that was to be redeveloped as noted by staff. And we have multifamily to the north. We have RES9 to the west. We have RES9 to the east. This is a transition from multi larger dwelling unit counts to single family. So it's not the traditional multifamily with you know three-story apartment buildings. We do have the cottages adjacent to the residential structures. Ours are one story up against one story, also separated by greenbelt buffering. And now I will turn it over to Mr. Merrill and he can discuss um, the legal issues on the easement. Thank you, Linda. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, commissioners. It's not evening yet. Uh, my name is Bill Merrill. I have been sworn um, with the ICARD Merrill Law Firm. Uh, with regard to the easement issue that was raised um, by one of the uh, folks or a couple of the folks, um, we have had our title agent, the company's title agent, uh, review the easements and the surveys. And they, I'll, I'll submit this um, to the record. And if you can hand these out, Bill. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, this is a letter from Goodkind. Goodkind and Floria, uh, their attorneys, and they are the title agent for Chicago Title. And Chicago Title has indicated that the easement on this property, not the portion of the easement that's on Oak Leaf, but the easement on this property will be merged into the title and will disappear upon closing. So again, it is they, they considered it a private easement, um, and it was for the house that was located up uh, on part of the other property that is part of this project. And again, also, uh, this was shown in the, in the PowerPoint, but this is the deed that provided the easement in that, in that regard. And again, it was just an ingress-egress easement. It did not indicate that it was for public uh, use. I also just want to mention, and I know that uh, <coughs> Bob Agruse will uh, answer any further questions on the, on the uh, transportation issues and the transportation improvements, but let's keep in mind these improvements that they're doing are not site related. And I think that uh, Commissioner Van Ostenbridge mentioned something similar to that. These are improvements that the county system needs because those roads are already failing without this project. And so they're looking at putting in about six, oh, six million or so in the budget um, for their project. And those improvements will be done with this project. They're done during the project. So they aren't done years later, they're doing, done concurrent with this project. So I think that's an important part to answer the question about timing. Thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and then, yeah, why don't you come on up, Matt, about the drainage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Good morning, Matt Morris with Morris Engineering. Uh, I have been sworn. Um, I'll hit on drainage a little bit, and I know uh, Commissioner Turner had asked a question earlier regarding timing and wanted to uh, provide a little more detail and color on the timing for uh, our project moving forward. But with regard to, with regard to stormwater specifically, um, we are aware of the, the drainage features that are coming through the property right now, the, the large ditches. Um, we're already talking to staff uh, in Public Works about uh, how best to address that with our project, whether it be uh, large culverts, box culverts, uh, rerouting um, those uh, those ditches through our project to make sure that that flow is maintained. Um, so we're required to do that by your code as well as the state requirements um, that we have to make sure if we've got water that's either uh, coming onto our site from adjacent property that we're continuing to allow that water to flow through our site just like it would so that we're not impounding it anywhere else. Um, and then we're also required to make sure that whatever water we're discharging to another site, we're not going to discharge more water there uh, in the post-development condition. So we've got the big watershed models that your county staff has uh, developed over the years that are, uh, from my experience, uh, pretty accurate. And we've got to prove within you know, a hundredth of a foot uh, comparing our pre-development to our post-development that we're not going to impact any adjacent properties uh, by raising the water levels more than that one one-hundredth of a foot. Um, and we, we always work with your, your staff very closely with those. They do a good job of uh, doing those reviews and um, some of these drainage reports we put together, you know, 1,500 page drainage reports that, uh, that provide all the backup and documentation for all that. Um, so from a drainage standpoint, we will look at that very closely. We know that uh, there are uh, those large drainage features. We'll also be working with your county staff to provide easements um, to the county that are necessary for the county to be able to get in and maintain those uh, water water features uh, as needed on a go-forward basis. Um, with regard to timing, just to kind of add into that a little bit, um, you know, based on uh, what transpires here today, moving forward, we'd end up having to go through uh, a whole design effort at this point, final design, permitting. Uh, it probably wouldn't be until December of this year before we'd even be in a position to actually break ground on the infrastructure. Uh, and then by the time we get the infrastructure uh, constructed and start going vertical with homes, we're probably talking sometime in uh, 2027 before you'd see a build out of all the vertical components of all the cottage units. And then even beyond that, uh, to have some leasing time uh, where you'd see kind of a full lease out of, uh, of the project. So from a standpoint of kind of tying that in with some of these roadway improvements, um, as Bill Merrill said, we'll be, we'll be constructing the specific improvements at 29th and 60th um, at the same time as our project's getting constructed, but uh, also you know, the county's gonna be doing those system improvements uh, beyond that intersection up and down 60th. Um, and it sounds like those will be done prior to the build out of our community here. Um, we are, again, working real close with uh, public works staff. We've already been sharing some survey data back and forth um, as we move forward into the final site plan and construction plan uh, steps of the project. We'll actually have to show those improvements that the county is going to be making on 60th as well to show that we're taking that into account um, on our plans for the intersection at 29th and 60th and that everything ties together seamlessly with that. So. Um, again, we've already started that process. We've already even uh, had some draft agreements kind of going back and forth between county staff and our, uh, our side to get that uh, agreement ironed out. But again, even, even to the point where we've been sharing some pretty detailed uh, design and survey information uh, with your county staff to make sure that everything does get designed seamlessly there. I used to live out by the outlet mall uh, myself as well in Oakley Place and uh, live in Parish now. So I'm familiar with that area and um, we definitely want to make sure we're doing a good job of uh, kind of creating that seamless integration with what the county's doing to, to help that situation too. So um, that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions that you guys have for me. Thanks. Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, what we'll do is go into Deliberation, conversation, any other? Uh, Mr. Cruz. Yeah, um, again, this is this is a project I, I want to like, and in, in theory, I, I don't dislike it. I, I love Built to Run. I think it's a, a great new business model that people are using. It it's, seems to be popular in the public. I like projects built along the interstate. It's it's good use of that space, especially rental properties. I, I don't have a fundamental and and you know from from the research I did, it's it's clearly a, a very strong 
uh, development group putting it up. I don't have a fundamental problem with the project. I just have a problem with the timing of the project and the density of the project. Um, it, it's what, like, like what Patty and a few other people said. It's this is a future land use of R6, which is a pretty reasonable amount already. It's not. It, it's not. We're not trying to stick you with ag. Um, you know, this that's a future land use that's that's way above what the current zoning is. And, and I think it's reasonable because, again, we're talking about the road improvements. They're not done now. I, I think the road improvement connecting to Buffalo, which I, I truly believe is fundamentally critical to Manatee County, just as a reliever for evacuations and, and 75, uh, is a great project. I don't think it helps here. In fact, I think it's detrimental here. I think you're going to have more people cutting from Moccasin Wall. I'll cut from Moccasin Wall down to 301 that direction. You're going to add more cars to this road, not less. It's, it's going to become better for Manatee County. I'm, I'm not disputing that, but that's not helping this project. But it was said earlier, we can't hold the developer responsible. We've, we've said this a million times. Uh, it's the government's responsibility to build roads. One, it's not a responsibility to build roads at your convenience, and, and it's not the CIP's prod job to chase developments. We, we have a, a course of, of timeline to build these things. And just because you want to build something doesn't mean that now becomes my priority because I got 40 other priorities of people that I previously approved that I promised to road to. And this is R6. Again, RCIP is based upon building roads in accordance with what we anticipate being there. Nobody anticipated R9 being on this location. So I, I, it's not government's job to build you the road at whatever size is convenient for whatever you're going to convince us to grant you. Um, you know, if you came in here and got you know, a, a 20-story tower, it doesn't mean I now have to build you the flyover tomorrow. Um, I, I'm building the roads in accordance with what the, the future development is on this. And to come and say, hey, it's R6, I want R9, that's great. I've never want to push back on additional density where it makes sense. I've approved most of the requests for additional density where it makes sense. But a lot of times it's just, hey, give me more because I can put some affordable housing there, workforce housing there, or just it fits. This doesn't seem like it fits. Uh, like it was said before, if it fit, you wouldn't be asking me for a lot of extra favors. Uh, you know, if it fit, you wouldn't need shorter buffers. You wouldn't need uh, less open space, or at least the bare minimum open space. Again, it's all <coughs> clustered. I think the only green space here is going to be whatever potted plant people put in front of their house. Um, you know, you're asking for a lot of concessions to fit it into R9. You, you don't need the R9. It doesn't fit for R9. If it did, you wouldn't need those. So I'm 100% on board with the R6. I do like the project. Uh, I, I do like the, the thing. I, I just don't know where the R9 fits. It doesn't fit for traffic. It doesn't fit for the site. It doesn't fit for the surrounding area. So I, I'm fully on board with the R6. I, I don't like the R9. I think it's an overreach of trying to get additional density just for added value in a place where it just doesn't make sense. So you want to come with R6? I will make the motion and approve it that minute. We don't even need to have a discussion. R9, I just think, is a little too much for this area. For It, it just doesn't fit. And it just certainly doesn't fit in terms of the timing. Thank you, sir. Mr. Turner. Yeah, most of these info projects or something with higher density, they, um, the developers are usually asking for a number of exceptions. I would use the case that just the one that we just approved unanimous, unanimously on Lena Road, there was exceptions on that one too. In this particular case, what I really like about it is the traffic issues are being resolved simultaneously rather than after the fact. I mean, really these, tr these uh, road improvements up to 26, the four lanes are going to be done before this project is completed, and we have that those that additional traffic. So I'm liking it the way it stands. The comp plan, as staff mentioned, allows for this kind of a shift given these kind of cir circumstances. So I don't think that we're we're making any super special um, exceptions here, especially given really the roadworks part of it is ahead of plan compared with most. So I'm okay with the way this is. Moving forward, thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there any additional comment from any other commissioners? With that, there's been a motion made by Commissioner Turner, uh, seconded by the chair, myself, Mike Ron. If we all vote at this time.
The motion carries five to two with Commissioner Satcher and Commissioner Cruz in opposition. Item 11. Item 11. Yes, item 11. Sorry about that. All right. Let me bring up. On item number 12, the motion has been made by Commissioner Turner and seconded by uh, Commissioner Van Ossenbridge. All those in favor, if you'd vote now. If we're not in favor, we'll still vote now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're not in favor, still vote now. And the motion carries 5-2 to two with Commissioner Satcher and Commissioner Cruz in opposition. Thank you very much. The snap. Next, dish, next item. Yes. Um, item number 13 is Plan Amendment 2216, Ordinance 2406, formerly known as 2372, Lazy Sea Ranch Large Scale Comprehensive me. Plan Excuse Map. We still, have a, we still have a meeting in progress. If you could exit qu quietly, we would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, so Lazy Sea Ranch Large Scale Comprehensive Plan Map and Text Amendment. And this is the adoption hearing of a privately initiated large scale map amendment for uh, approximately 405 acres of a uh, real property generally located okay. northeast of the intersection of Rutland Road, uh, County Road 675 and Rye Road North Parish from agricultural rural to urban fringe three, providing for a specific property development condition in the text of the comp plan amendment to limit the density, maximum density potential um, to 2.23 dwelling units per acre inclusive of any density bonus and to limit development of the property to residential uses only to be developed in accordance with policy 2.1.2.8 of the comprehensive plan as a component of the larger project located west of the future development boundary area. You're, re and you're reading, we're reading both in at the same time. Oh, I, yes, I apologize. So your presenter for the comp plan amendment would be Bill, Bill O'Shea. And then for item 14, PDR 2226 ZG Lazy Sea Ranch, Lazy Sea Ranch Holdings. This is the rezone, the companion rezone um, from general agricultural to plan development residential zoning district to be developed in accordance with policy 2.1.2.8 of the comprehensive plan <coughs> as a component of a larger product located west of the future development boundary area. As previously described in item number 13, for 1,100 residential units, single family and single family detached. And your staff presenter is Marshall Robinson. All right, thank you very much. Has there any ex parte on either one of these items? Sure. Seeing none, thank you very much. Applicant, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, Kyle Grimes, an attorney with the law firm of Grimes Galvano, and I have been sworn here today on behalf of the applicant, uh, Pulte Homes, as well as the current property owner, Lazy Sea Holdings, LLC. Uh, as uh, Ms. Knapp indicated, we're here for the uh, adoption hearing for the comprehensive plan amendment uh, to bring the property under a unified UF3 future development uh, uh, designation, as well as the text amendment for the limitation on, on maximum density and, and limiting it to residential uh, can, uh, with a proposed rezone to PDR uh, for 1,100 single family units. This is a project that, that you have all seen multiple times now. Uh, we just had it before you last month in December and we went through all the details of it very extensively. So I, I'm happy to go through a presentation if needed, but I know you all know it very well and I'm happy to just answer questions if, should you have any uh, or any of our uh, team that's here as well. Yeah, we've seen this thing several times. So I, I don't know if there's any questions from the board at this point. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. O'Shea. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Bill O'Shea with Development Services. I have been sworn. And as um, Mr. Grimes indicated, we have briefed you just recently and tried to bring you back up to date on the history of, of, these, of this site. Um, and we, did, we just discussed it. Um, at your December 7th meeting where you recommended transmittal. So I too really don't have anything to add but can answer questions for you. There, Marshall um, 
needs to talk to you probably about the site plan side. All right, thank you. Marshall. Good morning. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Marshall Robinson. I'm a staff planner. Um, so as you all know, this is a, a rezone application that I'm uh, talking about here, which is a related item to the plan amendment. And simply put, um, the rezone, if the plan amendment uh, were to be approved, the rezone uh, would implement those plan amendment policies. Uh, most notably, I just want to cover a couple of points to, to reiterate that the plan amendment does present a D5 condition to the, to the plan amendment that would limit the uh, maximum density to 2.23 uh, dwelling units per acre, which is 1,100 units. There's also some stipulations in the zoning that would implement policy uh, for the plan amendment. We have stipulation A6, which deals with the construction of a sewer line. And then we also have stipulation F1 that talks about the two-phase project and the access. There is two specific approvals that are proposed on the uh, GDP and then within the zoning ordinance. And one of them is for second means of access. Uh, their second access is uh, presented or proposed as a emergency access uh, until such time that the uh, uh, phase two or the 530th unit would be built. Uh, if the, uh, the sewer line's not ran down through there, then that access will be a full uh, residential access. There's a 50 foot roadway buffer along 675, and uh, there is um, upland preservation uh, along the east side of the property, provide an extra separation between this project property and uh, to the east of Foxbrook. So those are the highlights of the rezoning if the plan amendment were, were to carry, and I think, uh, I think staff may have some additional public comments that came in late yesterday afternoon that we'd like to hand out. And while Ms. Jenny is handing that out, I'd be happy to answer any questions or run through my project presentation if you have any. Thanks so much. No, sir. I think we've asked all the questions before. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> With that, I'd like to open the item up for public comment for anyone in, that is in the chambers today for public comment. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. And if there's any other questions for applicant, staff? I guess not. Um, so there's no staff closing comment. You're good? You're good, Marshall? Additional comments for me, Mr. Chair. Oh, your additional comments? Okay, Bill, thank you. No. None. You said none. Mm -hmm. You said none. I don't have any. Maybe for Bill? You want in the back. All right. Thank you. Um, you good? All right. Applicant, anything? Uh, no, Kyle Grimes again. Nothing to add, Mr. Chair. I did just want to clarify the record. There's been no changes of uh, what we have before you today that was presented at the last hearing. So just wanted to, to make that very clear. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With that, um, there's been a motion made by Commissioner Satcher and seconded by Commissioner Turner. All those, if you could vote now. And the item carries seven to zero. Thank you very much. Yep. Ms. Knapp. Item number 15 is LDCT 2360. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, so sorry. I just want to clarify, we have two motions. Oh, we got two motions. Yep. Two motions. We vote on the comp plan, man. We have to vote yeah, we on vote 12. On <clears throat> we vote on number 14. Yep. Oh, got sorry. Commissioner okay. Turner, do you want to make a comment? On item 14, we have a motion made by Commissioner Turner, seconded by Commissioner Van Ostenbridge. Please cast your votes at this time. And item 14 carries a 7 to 0. Thank you very much. Moving forward, um, are there any commissioner comments? Well, we have to just have one more item. Well, 50, it's 15? Oh, sorry. Didn't see it. Yeah. I'm just trying to get out of here. <laughs> Uh, item number 15, which is... How quick you can move the meeting along. Yeah, I guess there are. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. I'm trying to beat the KBO record. 
Um, go ahead, Ms. Knapp. Sorry about that. That's okay. Item number 15 is a companion to a previous item number 8. It's LDCT 2316, Ordinance 2404, County Initiated Land Development Code Text Amendment, Chapter 2 Definitions, Abbreviations, and Acronyms. And this is the request to hold the second public hearing prior to 5 p.m. Okay. Is there any... Is there any uh, public comment regarding this item? I don't see any. So I'll close public comment. Any commissioner comment? Yes, nope. Yeah, the public has left the building. Um, any commissioner comments regarding this item? Yes, sir. Uh, nope. Waiting for a motion. There's nothing on the uh, There you go. It's up. Thank you. All right, the, the motion's been made on item 15 by Commissioner Cruz, seconded by Commissioner Turner. And cast your votes now. And the item carries seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, are there any commissioner comments? Oh, nope, thank you. County Attorney? No, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Knapp? No, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. And there's no other commissioner agenda items, so with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>